as is rightly said rome was not built in a day it takes years of efforts hard work hardships to sculpt into what it is today good evening to all the distinguished guests of this evening our president of the dental council of india dr dibendu mujumdar sir a president of the indian association of conservative dentistry and endodontics dr v chandrashekar secretary of iicd dr mohan bhuneshwaram stalwarts and senior faculty of our association dr girish parmar dr p karuna kar sir the esteemed panelists of this evening colleagues friends and my dear student it gives me immense pride and pleasure to be representing here on the prestigious podium of this iicde iicde has been the apex body of the country and it has been continuously striving to contribute and to cater to all the educative and the academic needs of the fraternity to see that they stand in par with the global standards at this juncture i would like to make a mention of dr paromita mujumdar she is the moderator of today's uh, session and she has poured in her heart and soul and has put tremendous efforts to chisel out the format of uh, today's program and i'm sure it's going to keep you all uh, interested and glued to your screens so iicd has uh, taken lot of uh, efforts to lay various platforms to all the uh, students to bring out the best in them like the exchange programs we have uh, we have the collaborations we have recognition of the merits and the achievements of all the uh, meritorious uh, candidates and social reach out programs to see that we all uh, come out as the best clinicians of our nations so with guru purnima having just being celebrated over the uh, corner now again i am glad to present to you all the gurus the esteemed panelists who are here are nothing less than the gurus of our fraternity and they will be here to give us a very uh, interesting session in this evening which we are all looking forward to so i take privilege in introducing to you dr vivek hegde he is presently the vice president professor and head of department of conservative dentistry and endodontics Rangunwala Dental College Pune he is the president society of oral laser applications of india the director society of or director of the indian board of uh, endodontics the incoming president of uh, indian endodontic uh, society congratulations vivek on that a renowned clinician in india and specializes in microscope enhanced endodontics a pioneer in the use of microscopes in dentistry in india and lectures extensively as a speaker at the national and international conferences he is the course director for his teaching academy and conducts hands on clinical workshops in endodontics treatment retreatment laser dentistry and microscopic dentistry welcome dr vivek thank you dr narsimhan bharadwaj he is the founder director of access dental institute root canal center chennai affiliated with the prestigious masa university malaysia to conduct and certify the fellowship certificate in endodontics program presently he is designated as the professor department of conservative dentistry at savita dental college chennai and he is the first person to in in india to install and use the calzeis xero 300 microscope in his practice his field of interest include complex retreatment instrument retrieval etc he has two copyrights in original invention category the baro platform technique for broken instrument retrieval for which he was conferred the highest award for research in india fellow indian society of dental research and the second copyright is for modifying the focusing technique using the microscope in dentistry the reverse para focusing technique he is a founder faculty of masters fellowship in micro endodontics the first super specialty program in india an eminent speaker of over 350 invited guests lecture deliberations nationally and internationally with six scientific best paper awards and has authored about 14 index publications to his credit i welcome dr narsimhan bharadwaj thank you thank you so much ma'am dr gyan luka uh, platino he has received the alfred bean memorial prize for from chicago dental society for the best italian research graduate thesis 
2001-2003, the Hans Grand Award for the European Society of Endodontology for the Best European Researcher in 2013 and several other research prizes. From 2009, he worked in the Department of Endodontics at the La Sapienza University of Rome as Senior Lecturer and Professor of Scientific English in the School of Dental Hygiene until 2017. He has received the certification as Professor of the First and Second Level in 2017 and 2018, a certified member of the European Society of Endodontology, international member of the American Association of Endodontists, active member of the Italian Society of Conservative Dentistry and the Italian Academy of Endodontics. He has been an associate professor of the European Endodontic Journal and the Italian Journal of Endodontics and part of the editorial board of several other journals. He has published more than 100 articles on various endodontic and restorative topics and has two, authored two textbooks and numerous chapters and has uh, his two own patents. I welcome Dr. Gyanluka. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Now, Dr. Venkatesh Babu, recently he has been, uh, has received recognition with the IEJ. Dr. Venkatesh has been a teaching faculty in Division of Clinical Dentistry and heads the Dental Skills Center School of Dentistry, International Medical University, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And he's a visiting professor in School of Dentistry, Tehran University of Medical Sciences, Tehran, Iran. Associate editor of International Endodontic Journal, a project leader for developing reporting guidelines for various study designs in endodontics titled preferred reporting <coughs> items for study designs in endodontology that is pride and he is a prolific researcher who has 78 publications in reputed journal congratulations and welcome dr mengtesh uh, babu many thanks for your kind words ma'am dr vasudev balan one of the quietest but one of a prolific prolific researcher I would say he has been a professor in the Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics, Manipal College of Dental Sciences, Manipal. He is on the editorial board member of 20 international journals and reviewer of 70 international journals. He is the only Indian who received the best reviewer award out of the top 10 percentile in the world by American Association of Endodontists and Elsevier Publications in 2014 and 2016. He is awarded 11 times as an outstanding reviewer for the Journal of Endodontists by American Association of uh, Endodontists, outstanding reviewer for Journal of Dentistry and Journal of Herbal Medicine, and has received thrice the top reviewer in the world in dentistry, awarded by Publons Academy UK. He has 135 international publications and 25 national publications to his credit. That's quite a great achievement. I welcome Dr. Vasudev Balal. Thank you, madam. Thanks a lot. Yes. So now uh, we have all the uh, panelists who are gurus themselves. You can see the level of the achievements. And I'm surely today we are all looking this uh, evening to a very uh, dimensionally befitting clinical and academic uh, blend. So I wish and welcome all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Vibha ma'am. The current pandemic situation has left us not only stirred but shaken too, and there's a new level of disruption in our lives. But in an attempt to keep the spirit of learning and sharing alive, this initiative from IACDE will help us all to refresh existing knowledge and gain some more. The fraternity is well versed with the triad of non-surgical endodontic treatment. But since it is an evolving science, the rapid developments are at times overwhelming. Going by the famous axiom by Dr. Schilder, what comes out is as important as what goes in. We are here today to know something more on this front from our esteemed experts, which will help us to make choices and decisions in clinical practice or imparting education. The branch of endodontics has traveled a long way, starting with Fortune's mention of preparation of root canal and cauterization of pulp, 
use of piano wires, development of GG drills, K files, Altamere's rotary device, racer handpiece, gyromatic instruments, nickel titanium instruments, and so on. So, the question that can be posed here is, is it that we need to have instrument or device specific skill set, or is it the operator's basic skill which influences the instrumentation? May I turn to Dr. Vivek Hegre to address this, please? Thank you, Dr. Parumita. Uh, congratulations to the team uh, IACD for a wonderful uh, initiative. Best wishes to all the panelists and greetings to all the viewers. I think uh, a wonderful question has been put across to me about uh, having the operator, operator skill on the result of instrumentation. I know we've all seen the journey from say stainless steel uh, to the gates glidden drills to uh, gyromatic hand pieces to racers to the nickel titanium when Valia introduced it. Of course, we all know Valia is an Indian from uh, Nair who went abroad and uh, the rest is history. I mean, he has no more, so due respects and remi we remind him, let's, remi let's remember him now. Uh, about NITE coming to the metallurgy, I know there are so many generations from first till now on, how electroplating happened, how the designs changed with designs to length, diameter and taper. I'm sure Gyanluka will speak a lot about uh, when it comes to uh, the glide path of his topic. What I would like to put a point here is, I know we have changed designs, we've changed uh, from hand to rotary to reciprocation with respect to flexibility, it's become an M wire, an R face, or uh, it's become to a gold file or the blue files, whatever they may be. There's been a array of things that's happened. So what, there's been a single file or a multiple file. This is the out overlook. The question about operatory skills always will come in before or even now. Because I remember listening to one of my first lectures from James Gutman, where he actually told about Harry and Harry, which means hand assisted or power assisted. It was rotary instrumentation. He worked the use assisted that itself tells you it's about dentistry, you know. Dentistry is about art and science. I think science we all learn in school. Art is something that you develop. It's a skill development. So I think it's still about tactile. It's still about being gentle. Still about keeping it simple and safe. Because a lot of times, in general, when you talk endodontics, the apical third is not in focus. With respect to the zone of infection, with respect to the preparation, with respect to the cleansing and also completion. That is where you have to be gentle. If you don't destroy it, or if you don't damage it, if you don't be aggressive, I think it will respect you even more. It's like the principle of surgery. The bounce back is that much lesser. So with good reference points, if you have a good tactile sense, gentle pair of hands, be it rotary, be it reciprocation, or a hand guided, if you can glide the path well and get that completed well, I think it's here to stay. The most important thing is this way, you know. When we teach students, we all see this. We all teach them finger guards, we teach them dress. Somewhere down the line, let it be cross arch, same arch, opposite arch, wherever it may be. It's lost. It's not there with them. I don't know why. So all I'm trying to tell you is good rest, good rest, as close as to the tooth or as far as the tooth you want to be in, based on the ergonomics, the visibility, the accessibility, I think this is the most important variable we should think about, that operator still remains the most important part of the whole system. If I have to quote some studies from before, there have been so many studies done by many people. They have spoken about comparison between inexperienced person and an experienced person. With respect to canal preparations and coronal one-third, middle one-third, apical one-third, with respect to canal transportation, with respect to the time taken, with respect to one file versus multiple files, with respect to fracture of the files or any study it may be. 
I know at the end we end up reading that between experience and inexperience, there's not a significant difference with respect to some of the parameters. But one line every researcher, clinician, or a publisher will write is previous training is needed, experience and good clinical hands are needed. I think with that point, I would again emphasize that operator skill is that much more important to assist a hand, a rotary, or a reciprocation instrument. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So if I may put it in a gist, whatever we learn, we go by the book. And then continuously, we need to upgrade ourselves by means of training courses. And we need to uh, set the pros and cons of whatever uh, materials or equipment or technique, whatever new comes up. And then we have to understand what we are good at, what we are comfortable at. Is that so, sir? My understanding and for the benefit of the audience? Yes. In fact, uh, I would also want to add up to the beginners. Like I said, you have to be experienced clinicians, which means I personally have a rule in me. If you ask my early days, I was aggressive. If I have to show something to you, uh, if this is my handpiece, I used to hold it here. That's because in my school days, when I was reading my copywriting, I used to press too much. So when you turn the page to the next level and see the next page, if the impression has come, then you're pressing too much. That's one of the reasons why an instrument can fracture or you may have other trouble. So today what I'm asking is, instead of holding the handpiece here, if you come just half an inch back and hold exactly the same way you're holding, now you try and working, you cannot be pressing too much. That's what I mean by saying a gentle pair of hands. So this is the clinical tip I'd like to give. And also to beginners, my sincere request is, be it treatment, be it retreatment, be it any procedure that you want to take up. Please work on extracted teeth and models first. Take simpler tooth first, like a single rooted, then maybe multi rooted, like a two rooted one, and then a molar or something. Thereby, possibly, you will develop and cultivate a protocol for yourself and help acclimatize yourself in such a way that uh, you try and become graduating yourself from the lower level to the higher level to that level of genius that you want to be. Thank you. Thank you. Very nicely explained, sir. Uh, now, preparation time in automated systems is shorter. And consequently, the time available for irrigation and disinfection of root canal system is substantially reduced, which must be compensated by using increased volume of irrigants. Uh, can I have Dr. Gianluca Platino to address this, please? Thank you, Dr. Pa Aromita, let me firstly thank the IACDE for the invitation to this uh, beautiful event. I'm really happy to be part of this uh, panelist list and uh, it's an honor for me. Thank you so much. I have uh, interrupted earlier my clinical activity today because I, it was a, really an honor for me to be part of this, of this event. And uh, especially in this moment, I'm seeing growing up very much the number of cases in, in India. Uh, we in Italy, we have passed the worst period. Uh, I hope it will never come again, but uh, I want to, to give my, my big hug with, to, to all the Indian people and please stay safe and stay strong. And thank you for, for your question. And I want to thank also Dr. Vitek for, for his uh, speech before, because it's very, very true that um, the uh, uh, operator skills is very important, hands are important, brain is very important in endodontics. We are lucky today uh, because technology has increased very much our possibilities as endodontists. Uh, honestly, today, uh, anyone can conduct a very well-made endodontic treatment much easier and faster and in a predictable way. This is thanks to the new technologies that, that we have uh, at our disposal. Uh, especially, I, I, study, I have studied a lot the evolution of endodontic instruments. So the evolution in terms of safety, 
and uh, effective, effectiveness in, in cutting led us to, to make our treatment faster and more efficient with the nickel titanium file. The rise of reciprocation make these, these, these uh, treatments much, much safer and even faster. The reciprocation with single file, for example, really fastened the, the treatment. So the question is very important for everyone, for the beginners and for the experts, because as experts also, we are increasing very much our expertise, also reducing the treating time because we are faster as, as we become uh, more expert. So what we uh, remove in time from the instrumentation phase, in my opinion, we have to add to have a better cleaning of the root canal. So the, your suggestion to, to increase the, the concentration or the volume of irrigants is very important. We have seen in, in several studies that the amount of irrigant is very important. So frequent exchange of new irrigants, uh, especially sodium hypochlorite, fresh sodium hypochlorite for, for its increased antibacterial activity and in its increased uh, dissolving properties. This is very important. But we have also, I, I always uh, push on um, increasing the effectiveness of our irrigation. So if we have less time for cleaning, we have to, in, to, to use this cleaning time with a big power, an enhanced power. So we have to use a powered irrigation. So we have to use activation of the irrigants as much as possible, starting from the simplest technique like the manual dynamic activation to the st gold standard ultrasonic or high power sonic activation or using laser uh, activation of irrigants, everything that can improve the quality of our cleaning. And the profit, but all with, uh, we have never to, for, to forget that the quality of our cleaning starts from the quality of our instrumentation because mechanical uh, instrumentation is the first step for the mechanic, for the reduction of intracanal infection because it's like to remove a carious tissue in the coronal restoration. We remove all the carious tissue because it's infected. We have in infected root canals also dentinal infection. So the mechanical removal of this layer of dentin is also important to decrease as much as possible the, uh, the infection inside the root canal. So this is the first step, quality of the instrumentation, respect of the sides of the anatomical sides of the instrumentation, so to create the correct space to deliver our irrigants to the apical third, increasing the effectiveness through a powered irrigation step, increasing the volume and possibly increasing the time, especially in some specific cases like residual infection in retreatment or uh, multiple uh, or difficult anatomies. Thank you, sir. So I think the uh, take home message here would be to use a power irrigation, use all those methods which can increase the efficacy of the irrigants, laser. We will come to all these topics as we move and progress into the discussion. But sir, could you just uh, clarify to our viewers, our participants, you mentioned sodium hypochlorite. Uh, what is the concentration, the potency of the sodium hypochlorite, if you could give an idea? Yeah. Uh, honestly, my clinical practice, I would like to use the highest possible concentration of sodium hypochlorite, so in between five to six, keeping very, very good attention to not extrude this irrigant to avoid possible accidents by uh, uh, sodium hypochlorite extrusion. We have to say that probably we can reduce this concentration by, uh, by uh, using it for, for, uh, in more amount and for more time if we want to be safer. And for example, in vital teeth, we don't need so much antimicrobial efficacy, so probably we can reduce a bit the concentration in these cases. Thank you. And uh, thank you, sir, for your concern about our country regarding the pandemic situation, I hope. And I know we will come out of it. It's a matter of time. Thank you again. So another question that is posed to the fraternity is, how much of root canal preparation paper may be considered optimal since there are so many options available to choose from? Can I request Dr. Narsiman Bharadwaj to give his ideas on this? A very good evening. Uh, my wholehearted thank you to IACD president and secretary and uh, especially my good friend Dr. Mohan for giving me these wonderful opportunities. 
and my warm greetings to all my gurus colleagues students and uh, well wishers and uh, my microscopic mentor dr vivek a special mention to you as well so uh, this is one question and this is my favorite uh, topic where i address wherever i go to choose between uh, which people or in simple words uh, every postgraduate student before the viva when they enter inside uh, i still remember when i was a staff they used to come and ask me sir the examiner what file is he using so that, that when they know the file they know that that is the best paper to tell so because uh, as we understand uh, can you just move on to the slides uh, uh, yes as, sir yeah as we understand uh, if you see here there are two options one is a greater taper option and the lesser taper option and i think every endodontist would uh, know this and uh, if you see by the references and the studies if there are 100 references to show that greater taper uh, is efficient in removing organisms there are probably a similar 100 references to show that a lesser taper would do the same job but at the same time would keep the pericervical dentin so uh, every both the both these techniques had equal amount of uh, references to back themselves up so the million dollar question is how do we go about should we restrict ourselves with a lesser taper or should we take it to a higher taper uh, next question next slide ma'am so when you see here i'm just giving you uh, some good articles very very substantially clinically sound articles uh, written by renowned persons like buchanan next this is from buchanan and this is from uh, richard mounds and uh, my next slide has a uh, article from um, uh, dean guff and john wallace so this article i would like to highlight why because it's uh, from the postgraduate's perspective something we call it as a meta analysis so when you know that it's a meta analysis it's a, it's a, it's a huge uh, process wherein a lot of inputs are taken i'll show you in my next slide that uh, a lot of people a lot of people you can see the names there like cutler or kasahar or tronsted michuti gutman all of them have contributed to this particular article and uh, the whole crux of the article is what is master apical rotary the most suited uh, next so if you see now the result what they achieved here in that they say that size 25 6% was considered optimum for a canal with an initial apical file of 10 if you want the irrigant to reach the apical third passively so i repeat that if you want the irrigant to reach the apical third passively now size 25 4 was still fine but you have to find a method of reaching the apical third of the irrigant and you need activation for enhanced time periods so the the difference is only in the irrigation and i am not going into irrigation because a lot of people like venkatesh and others are going to be discussing in depth about irrigation but the gist is basically the selection of taper is basically to allow the irrigant to reach the apical third as rightly mentioned by my good friend vivek endodontics is all about treating the apical third if you are able to treat the apical 3 mm i think your endodontics is over that's it so if you are able to just treat the apical 3 mm clean reach first reach clean shape and seal i think rest is his rest is just a matter of uh, uh, just fall, fall into place and regarding the pericervical dentin if you see here increase in more than 8% is going to result in a pericervical dentin thickness which is going to be geopolized now for this in my next slide i'll show you a very simple technique like for example now you want to know how do we reach the apical third whether you want to go for a, a a rigid system or a flexible option what is the ideal size so i'll just show you in my next a very very simple experiment uh, this is not a study everybody here who is watching can do it just take an acrylic block you prepare the acrylic block to a 4% 25 6% 25 and then 4% 30 and a 6% 30 now all you have to do is in my next uh you just take two gauges of needle which is most commonly used the 30 gauge needle and the 26 gauge needle now next you can just go ahead go ahead ma'am so if you see here is just a very simple thing you try inserting the needle passively don't wedge it you just try inserting the needle passively and you will see that in all the 4% tapered preparations the needle doesn't go anything beyond the middle third so if the needle doesn't travel anything beyond the middle third the moment you irrigate the moment you irrigate yes you can go to the next 
you can see that the irrigant is more on the coronal third. We call it as regurgitation. The moment you irrigate because of negative pressure, the irrigant just comes to the coronal third. There's absolutely no irrigant in the apical. This is what I was precisely telling you that in a 4% taper, the irrigant doesn't passively reach the apical third. Whereas in a 6% taper, you can see that the needle progresses just about one millimeter, just one to 1.5 mm slightly below. And the result is, you can see that the moment you irrigate, next slide. You can see that the moment you irrigate, you can appreciate that the irrigant is actually there pulled in the apical third. So the whole point is, and if you are going to use, say for instance, a, a flexible needle, like made up of polypropoxylene, you can appreciate in my next slide that, you can see that the needle in a 4% taper, this is a size 25 4% taper, where you can see the needle reaching virtually almost one millimeter short of the apical third. So the delivery system also plays a huge difference. That is one. So the, the most important thing which I would like to impress upon here is that now which is better four or six percent will totally depend upon your irrigant delivery system and the irrigation protocols. If you are able to get a good irrigation protocol, a four percent is good enough. Now the second point which I would like to add is that when we talk about, next slide ma'am, when we talk about orifice enhancement, I'm a firm believer of orifice enhancement. A lot of people say that you should not enhance the orifice because if you enhance the orifice, you're unnecessarily widening it. But what happens is only when you enhance the orifice, you get a, something called as an irrigant reservoir where you want the hypochlorite to be pulled in at the coronal third for you to be useful in all aspects. Like uh, now Dr. Vasudev sir is going to be talking on chelating agents, so I'm not going to be discussing on that. So you need adequate amount of hypochlorite at the coronal third as well. So that is what precisely I want to impress upon. Thank you very much, sir. And the experiment was very clear, simple, but we could relate exactly what you wanted to say. And uh, as uh, we know endodontics is not an area where the aesthetic part is important. On an x-ray, we see that lots of katapasha has been uh, put there, but at the expense of the circumferential dentine, it is exactly. not an area. But we have to take care and we have to keep in mind that these are going hand in hand. The irrigant delivery system that you are yes. emphasizing more and this will decide which taper we should be following for exactly. person, six person. That's why we always say that, you know, you have to shape the canal to clean it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These points are very important. Reach, clean, shape and yeah. seal. Yeah. That's your mantra. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. And uh, the root canal dimensions, as we were discussing, and consequently the space available for cleaning action of irrigations Irrigants is very important thus. Now, if we consider a standardized root canal preparation is made, which parameter of the irrigant might influence the treatment outcome most? Will it be the volume, the type, the concentration, the activation, the regime, the delivery mechanism? Uh, could I have Dr. Vasudev Balla's view on this? Good evening, madam. Good evening for all the participants and my colleagues. Uh, at the outset, first of all, I need to, I like to thank our IACD president, Dr. Chandrasekhar, as well as our uh, dynamic secretary, Dr. Mohan Bhuneshwaran, for inviting me for this lovely combo platform. I say this as a combo because we have uh, beautiful, great clinicians over here, Vivek, Dr. Vivek and Dr. Narsimhan, etc. And we have a great researchers also. So this is a very good combo platform for everybody to discuss. So coming on to the question, <clears throat> which parameter is more important when we irrigate the root canals? So if you see the literature, evidence-based or research-based, there are multiple factors which accounts for the clinical outcome of the irrigation. So based on this, some of the already factors, I think uh, Dr. Gayan Loka has already spoken about volume, etc. Volume, according to me, the volume of the root canal irrigation is very, very important. As such, there is no clinical data or there is no any clinical research or research-based evidence to say how much we need to irrigate or how much volume we need to use for irrigation. It depends on case to case. So a central incisor or a single root canal, you might use less irrigant. When you go for a complex anatomy like mandibular molars or maxillary molars, you may have to use more irrigant. 
but volume always matters we need to use enough adequate irrigant that is we need to uh, properly replenishment the irrigant that is very important sodium hypochlorite has to go inside the canal come outside the canal continuously so that matters again what type of irrigation delivery you are going to use whether you are going to use a needle irrigation or whether you are going to use a machine assisted irrigant when you are using a machine assisted irrigant i think dr venkatesh will be speaking more on that we need more amount of volume of irrigant compared to needle irrigation this is one and second thing what we need to know is when we use hypochlorite hypochlorite again it is a gold standard we every endodontist have to use hypochlorite when we use the hypochlorite inside the root canal dentin it cannot exert its complete action because something called as a tissue inhibition or dentin inhibition debris inhibition so there is something called as a dentin effect so what happens is this debris which is produced during the cleaning and shaping reacts with the sodium hypochlorite and it inhibits its antimicrobial effect and tissue dissolving effect there are beautiful articles by dr teresa on this where they have shown the dentin itself will inhibits the action of sodium hypochlorite so in such cases volume matters a lot we need to use continuously copious irrigation of the root canal so that we have enough adequate uh, hypochlorite in the canal one thing what i have to want to say is never ever instrument the canal without an irrigant always keep the canal wet so see that hypochlorite is in the canal and you do the instrumentation that is regarding the volume so coming on to the type i think we all use there are multiple irrigants i don't think this is a platform for me to talk about that but the commonly used is a sodium hypochlorite and as well as a chelator again chelator we'll be talking later me and dr vivek will be discussing about that coming on to the concentration so concentration again dr gan luka said but i am sorry uh, dr gan luka i am little bit not against higher using higher concentration of sodium hypochlorite uh, i prefer to use lesser concentration because 2.53% is much much enough there is enough evidence based to say that tissue dissolving antibacterial action clinical outcome penetration inside the root canal dentin everything 3% hypochlorite is as efficient as 6% so you can use i know a lot of people use 6.2% uh, of uh, sodium hypochlorite but one thing you need to remember is it is very cautious very toxic if it goes beyond the apex and second thing it is a very strong proteolytic agent so there is again enough studies to show that high concentration of sodium hypochlorite can damage the dentin because it is a high proteolytic agent it acts on the collagen of the dentin and it massively reduces the flexural strength and tensile strength of the dentin so you need to be very careful when you are using a high concentration of sodium hypochlorite one more thing which is very important usually most of the endodontists or clinicians miss is the ph i want to stress on this ph of a sodium of a irrigant so whenever we use any irrigant because i have seen some of the clinicians and all they buy themselves irrigant they make edta themselves they make hypochlorite themselves in the clinic and they use it is very dangerous because they never give any concentration for the ph ph is a game changer when we are using a sodium hypochlorite any for example any irrigant so myself and my team we did a study last year which is published in acta odontologica scandinavia journal we just selected two brands of edta just to see the role of ph i don't want to name the company here because i am not there to promote any company but we used two brands of edta which is manufactured by us the big companies and we did, saw for the accumulation of the hard tissue debris while using this chelating agent so one edta had lesser ph of around 7 to 8 and one had a higher ph of 11 to 12 so always higher ph of edta is very very detrimental so if you want a good chelating action of an edta always go for the ph which is around 7 to 8 i think this is very very important factor we usually miss because we go to the shop we buy the edta we are hardly and some of the packets ph is not mentioned also so we need to see what is a ph so all these things matters a lot when we are doing a root canal irrigation thank you very much so uh, though we have a difference of opinion here but i think we can all agree that uh, concentration between 3% to 6% for sodium hypochlorite is clinically acceptable uh, to the fraternity and the ph aspect that you have mentioned and you have made other people think i think uh, more and more people will now be aware and we will really seriously look into this aspect uh, but one thing i would like to ask you as you said the volume versus the concentration mm -hmm. so how do we make that balance for example sodium hypochlorite if you use 3% and some other person is using 6% now how 
is the volume to be adjusted how will we know explanations see madam as such i told you again there is no any research done telling that this much volume you should use for one particular canal there is nothing as such it all depends upon the type of teeth what you are using what you are doing the root canal as i said if you are using a single rooted teeth the volume may not be that much compared to a multi rooted teeth in multi rooted tooth also if you are using like low molars where you have a lot of apical morphology variation you have isthmus etc and you are using any delivery systems the amount or the volume of irrigant what you are going to use will be much much more than compared to a single rooted teeth where you are using a needle irrigation so we cannot standardize as such telling for this particular teeth we need to use this much volume of irrigant no there is no any clinical data available also and it is not possible also to standardize the volume of irrigant but one thing what we should remember is there should be a continuous replacement of the sodium hypochlorite throughout the mechanical instrumentation of the root canal system see that the canal is always wet it is soaked with sodium hypochlorite and you don't do any instrumentation dry inside the canal thank you but we are discussing only about sodium hypochlorite but that is not the only irrigant that is available there are lots of choices yeah. of that so there are again if view? you are if you are asking about other irrigants it might be a single rooted single irrigants or it might be a dual rinse irrigants so usually sodium hypochlorite is a gold standard which we through use throughout mechanical instrumentation and in the end of the instrumentation we use a chelator to remove the debris i think regarding chelating agent i think me and dr vivek will be speaking in the later stage we can speak in detail about type of chelating agents to be used and how to be used what is which is the best chelating agent i think we'll discuss in the previous course next course thank you very much and uh, now uh, we know that irrigants play a role in augmenting the mechanical debridement by flushing action thereby disinfecting the root canal system this particular question i would like to throw to dr venkatesh babu but before he can answer this question i would like to congratulate him and i would like to congratulate him on behalf of the entire fraternity for this particular achievement he has been awarded the young investigator award in the individual category for research and publications by the international malaysia university img congratulations again sir thank you thank you ma'am and now please enlighten us with your views on this okay ma'am first i would like to thank iacd and my special thanks to my brother mohan sir for giving me this opportunity especially on my weekend especially my time is around 10 10:15 at this time ma'am can you go to my previous slide which is showed my certificate yeah yes. if you see that last line it's 24th july so today i got this award so generally by this time on friday evening i would have been irrigated myself but unfortunately because of my brother <laughs> <laughs> yeah today we uh, will have that later sir yeah yeah of course of course i will catch him so through this in the morning <laughs> i will say cheers to him by virtual after the program ends now <laughs> uh, can i go to the my question ma'am yes yeah, sir apart, apart from joke uh, today question to me is what are the methods to increase the efficacy of irrigants do the role of activation or agitation techniques plays a key role in improving the success of endodontics coming to the first part of my question generally you have a lot of methods to increase the efficacy of irrigants the most preferable technique is adding a detergent for example you have nissin cetrimide and all those things you can mix with the regular irrigant it will improve the efficacy basically to tap your surface tension so the flow will be better obviously the irrigant will go till the apex and it will hit my beautiful box so that is the role of detergents here the next method is heating so generally we use to heat the sodium hypochlorite so once we use inside the root canal automatically it will have better antimicrobial efficacy so there are a lot of studies showing that if you heat the hypochlorite it will improve your pulp dissolution ability as well as the antimicrobial efficacy but i doubt whether these two things can be used in the clinical practice so 
that's why the most accepted method is the agitation techniques in my way of telling oil few things i will be telling few important papers i will request the postgraduate students to take a make a make a clear note of that because whatever reference which i am telling is a clear uh, milestone papers it will you have to read at least once during your master days so here to know a little bit detail about the irrigation techniques you have a review of contemporary irrigant agitation techniques and device which got published in journal of endodontics it was written by prof pashley and tay say so they have beautifully classified your agitation techniques into two one is manual and another one is machine assisted so manual means you are regular file and gutta percha so as narsimhan bhartwa sir said just put few drops in your coronal part then you can track your hypochlorite till your apex same way you can use your gutta percha as well after your cleaning and shaping not before your shaping once you done with your shaping put your hypochlorite take your gutta percha you can push till the apical part the next most important which everybody is following is machine assisted irrigation technique so in this technique as we all know the most popular is ultrasonic endovac and rinse endo so now to go little bit physics behind the irrigation dynamics is imagine you have a parallel walls tube if you push your irrigant to one end what will happen automatically the irrigant will come to your another end this scenario applicable applicable in your open apex cases that's why most of our teachers used to say if you are using hypochlorite in your wide open apex be careful because the irrigant will go hit your periapical area whereas in 99 percentage our root canal is completely different because orifice it will be a little bit wider as it goes down and down the apical end comes very narrow so the physics is if you push your any liquid in the open end to the close end your liquid won't reach to your apex the physics is because of gas entrapment this is the terminology phenomenon called vapor lock effect so if you push your hypochlorite it will mix with all your organic material in the root canal and it will form an apical gas material so it won't reach my apical part so if my if my irrigant is not reaching in apical part what will happen still i have as i told you i have good friends in my apical part i have bacteria i have e fecalis i have covid 19 viruses so it can't be removed so that's why if i use some external agitation techniques this technique will push my irrigant till my apex this is the phenomenon physics began my irrigation dynamics now the next controversy is how do the ultrasonic work as i told you this pushes the irrigant till the apex same way it creates the shear stress it pushes the irrigants towards the wall so what happens it detaches all my bugs from the walls so this is the main physics behind my ultrasonic same way it will improve the flow penetrability inside the dentinal tubules so that's why if you see a lot of evidences you have for penetration ability of ultrasonic the next you have most popular is endovac coming to the endovac also is works under the negative pressure again due to this negative pressure most of my bacteria it will clean the canals perfectly again the controversy comes which is the best ultrasonic or endovac coming to the clinical practice there is a one study it's a clinical study what they did is they compared needle irrigation ultrasonic and endovac they pushed the irrigant using this three method and measured what is the level of penetration of irrigant in this ultrasonic is the best it takes my liquid till 0.2 from the apex whereas endovac is almost 0.5 to 1 mm whereas the needle irrigation goes by 1.5 to 3 mm so this study clearly shows your ultrasonic is the best next coming to the microbial load uh, two two years back me and prasanna from hku oh, wow. did a systematic review on the in vitro studies to show the efficacy of ultrasonics against microbial load in that review we concluded saying that ultrasonic is the best agitation technique compared to other mechanisms in in regard to the antimicrobial agent 
same way as i told you now sorry as i told you so far to summarize my ultrasonic and endovac completely cleans the canal kills the bacteria so what so what is the advantage for the clinical practice it kills the bacteria so what way it improves my practice and what way the success of endodontics is improved if you see any outcome of root canal treatment is measured by two main things especially the first one for private practitioner is patient should be completely asymptomatic the next one is how do you assess the success of root canal is by seeing the periapical radiograph following after 6 months time or 1 month time the healing has to be reduced so to find out answer for these two things i did a little bit literature search for pain i never got any paper any strong evidence for systematic review so what i did is me and one of my close friend from adelaide gampiro we did a systematic review and meta analysis to show whether this machine assisted agitation helps to reduce the post op pain in that paper got published in journal of endodontics last year if you want you can read the paper in that paper we clearly showed that if you use the machine assisted agitation irrigation it reduces the post op pain significantly compared to the needle irrigation this is what we proved coming to the next my query is how it happened to the healing again i did the literature search but i'm completely surprised by seeing the result i can find two systematic reviews with that saying that the ultrasonic irrigation has not greatly influenced the periapical healing they saying the ultrasonic irrigation as well as syringe irrigation in terms of healing is same so this is what they concluded but if you see my point of view even though the healing is not improved drastically because of other advantages i feel this passive ultrasonic irrigation has to be the part of endodontics this is my opinion so far but still in this i would like to ask the view of vivek sir and naram simon sir because they are highly using they will be using this ultrasonic or endovac or any irrigation devices in their practice in their practice have they seen whether the radiolucency is come down or not i think they are the right person to explain this part here thank you definitely sir and dr narsimhan bhardwaj please thank you thank you ma'am and uh, yes definitely as rightly said by venkatesh there's absolutely uh, no second thoughts about it i don't do any case without uh, machine assisted uh, irrigation but uh, only one small thing i would like to just add up or probably uh, even ask venkatesh only thing is i used to be using ultrasonics earlier what i realized is since the ultrasonic delivery methods or the passive ultrasonic irrigation is by means of predominantly stainless steel tips so what happens is many a times when there is even a mildest of curvature in the middle third so if you have to touch the middle third curvature it results in separation of the tip or i am not very comfortable uh, or i would say that you know i am not confident that the irrigation has reached the apical part so whereas when i use a polymer based system i don't want to again i am not uh, promoting any company here when i use a polymer based system which is a sonic i know that i can flex the sonic i can go inside and i ensure that there is kind of activation at the apical third as well so but uh, uh, this is from a clinician's perspective and especially when you work on an upper seven or a mesio buccal canal or a distal buccal canal so taking a straight stainless steel ultrasonic device onto a straight line axis on the canal becomes a slightly challenge in the presence of rubber dam whereas when you have a polymer you can actually pre bend the polymer and put it inside this is purely from a clinician's perspective of course i i do not know about the uh, uh, research point of view whether the amount of activation of a sonic at the apical third can be compared to an ultrasonic or how efficient it is i think venkatesh will be the right person to take it from here before that vivek can throw his views as well okay thank you uh, narsimhan congratulations to venkatesh for that achievement thank And, you sir uh, this is a good question is a good clinical question uh, if you ask me order of preference i would want to support lasers first i have used almost many activation methods 
So I'll come to that a little later because I would want to share some slides maybe if there is time. So laser assisted activation would be the first best option if you can afford it. The bigger problem would be uh, the economics in India. But uh, what we need is an acoustic micro streaming. There has to be cavitation that happen. If the cavitation has to happen, then I think uh, between sonic and ultrasonic, ultrasonic will definitely score better. The reason being now it's a personal choice from clinician to clinician. From manual dynamic, like using a simple Gadaparcha point also has been proven quite well by a couple of papers. It is as comparable to the other methods. That's what they've been telling. So it's like, how much money do you have? If you don't have much money for the beginners, manual dynamic activation, one size larger than the master apical size, the Gadaparcha point can be chosen. 50 to 60 times a minute, do an aggressive agitation. You could use a hand file. You could use the irrigating needle, the syringe, can be done the same. Then you have some rotary files from, say, companies like Roco or uh, an XP Endo Finisher. It's also a promising product. Then you can come for some uh, polymer base like what uh, Narsiman told which are like say endo activator or uh, from some other companies like Ultradent or some other companies. Also, you can think of uh, Irisafe file from say Satellite when it comes to ultrasonics. They're non-cutting files. You have some negative pressure techniques uh, with heat liberations or heating of the tips into the canals. And one of the last would be uh, lasers. When I talk of lasers, I'm talking of uh, the hard tissue lasers, not the soft tissue lasers, which means those tips will come with uh, a PIPS, which is called photon induced photo acoustic streaming, or you have preciso tips or an X pulse. These are all different names of tips which work differently. One of the most newer tips is called sweeps, a short wave enhanced emission photo acoustic streamings. So these are all the newer recent advances. So people who can afford, in fact, I had a good chance to talk to some of the great clinicians around the world. And many of them have agreed that laser is one of the best ways to activate anything in the deepest part of the root canal, provided you can afford it. The only thing that's going against lasers is the cost. I would rate it this way, definitely lasers first, then it comes to ultrasonics and sonics, then the rotary drills, and manual dynamic activation. This is I would like to put in the order of preference. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that was very comprehensive uh, amalgamation of research, evidence, and clinical practice. And of course, you've saved some money for us. <laughs> 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 so, and the order of preference was uh, very nicely explained. Uh, but could you just emphasize a little more on the role of lasers now that uh, we will save money and then later make it up. So what can be the role of lasers, the application, if you could just tell us uh, later on, definitely we will come back to you for some demonstrations, if you could show us something. But as of now, uh, just okay. uh, what can be done, achievable things. Okay. I, I put it this way, the practical problems of uh, working in... Uh, the clinical situation is, firstly, it's the macro anatomy, the complexity of the root canal system. The second problem is the micro anatomy, the dentinal tubules. In fact, a couple of clinicians spoke before me spoke about the complexity of the dentinal tubules. Per square millimeter, you can have about 45,000 to 60,000 cut dentinal tubules into which goes and hides the bacteria or the virus or the microbes. Now, the depth of the biggest limitation of an irrigant is the depth of penetration. We have seen a lot of studies after the preparation has been done, the depth of penetration of the irrigant is only 100 microns, 150 microns, 180, 200, that's it. 1000 microns make a millimeter. So if you ask me, bacteria like the most stubborn one, I'm only talking of one now, the E. fecalis. E, e fecal, as you see the studies, it says it can lie in depths of more than a millimeter. That's more than a thousand microns. 
why laser became popular is earlier yes they used the heat of the lasers they said it's a thermal laser the infrared laser i want to heat up the tooth and try and eradicate everything that comes around but to be very frank if you talk of lasers now lasers has got there are classification broadly like a hard tissue laser a soft tissue laser and a soft laser when you talk of hard tissue laser it comes to the family of erbium family the erbium yag or the erbium chromium when you talk of the soft tissue lasers they are like the diodes the ndx the co2s or the ktps when you talk of the soft laser they are less than half a watt less than 500 milliwatts they are like the biostimulative lasers all of these lasers has a place in dentistry and also endodontics but what i will stress upon is something known as a hard tissue laser which is also known as all tissue lasers now to understand this way a soft tissue laser cannot work on a hard tissue why am i making this point this is because we have got good teachers in our country but they will pick up an article due respects to anybody and everybody saying this is the key article but the key article is about 10 years old if you are taking up a laser study please contact me or any one of us who know it to tell it will work if you go 10 years before and see a research people have used co2 lasers people have used diode lasers ndag lasers on the enamel and dentine laser works on a very different principle laser of course cuts coagulates ablates and vaporizes but the action of laser is what the best is absorption but along with it there can be a transmission there can be a reflection there can be scattering if, if i take a soft tissue laser like a diode or an ndag and put it on the enamel my pulp will get cooked up because it will transmit through and through so understand one thing when you think of lasers the old studies don't exist anymore however they have been published because those days our limitations of knowledge was just that much that's how science has evolved today if i talk of co2 laser co2 cannot go into the tooth at all because there's no ergonomics you don't have a contra angle bend how can you use a straight laser onto the tooth that way it can't work so cutting the whole story short think of only erbium family the erbium yag or the erbium ysgg these are actually hard tissue lasers like a all tissue lasers which have got specific tips they can be used for many purposes in dentistry cutting the story short straight into endodontics into the root canal what you need to know is there are tips like i mentioned enrico divito was a person with giano olivi i think uh, gian luca will know him he's from uh, rome i think so he's from italy uh, in his senior he works i think so or uh, research done anyway the point is they have devised a tip which was sold by a company called photo the company was biologists which had their own tips these tips started working in a principle of short wave pulses which means what we are talking of lamer flow or tubular flow they help in the tubular movement they not only help in the bio uh, film removal or the smear layer removal they help in the sterility of dentine most of the times lasers work with absorption i told you and to get it absorbed they should be chromophores which means they should be pigmented like when i use a laser on my skin or my gingiva it is red color so there is a pigment which absorbs it when it for bleaching there are chromophores in the bleaching agent which absorb the laser light and oxidizes unfortunately e fecalis is a transparent bacteria it doesn't absorb the only way to ablate uh, e fecalis is try and raise the temperature that is why if you see the literature ndag laser is the most important choice followed by the erbium yag laser for an endodontist for its deeper penetration so if you ask me if there's time we'll play videos if there's no time it's a panel discussion i'd like to stick to that so if you can afford it i would definitely focus and force everybody some day you would want to have the erbium yag family along with this newer tips that's coming in to have effective better deeper cleansing of the root canal system thank you i hope i was not thank too you, long sir.
<laughs> no, no, perfectly. We had some, uh, we had a nice overview. But tell me something, sir. Uh, you said for this particular disinfection, what should be the contact time? I mean, how much? What are the guidelines on those? When it comes to what lasers in heart tissue, you're going to use in uh, less than one watt. The millijoules will be about 20 millijoules. You are just going to use for about 20 seconds to one minute. It's going to be only a few cycles. And the beauty of it is, all those speakers who spoke before spoke what's given, which means you have to reach the apical third, which means your needle or your instrument or your activation device has to be at the last two or three millimeters. In the newer devices, what I told, diode does not work. Let's be clear. NDI also heats up the system, but it may char the system. It might melt the dentine and there are other limitations. Today, what I'm talking of this Erbium Yak family lasers, the tip is kept at the entry point of the canal. So it's far away in a non-contact mode. The only thing it's asking is fresh de delivery of an irrigant, like a hypochloride. If like what Dr. Vasudev said, I totally agree with him. You can go for a diluted version with lasers. Especially when the canal diameter is large and you don't want to think push things beyond. But it works in a sub-ablative range, which is 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 watts. It can't do anything else except help a tsunami effect of an acoustic streaming in the root canal. That's it. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sure this was a very clear, lucid explanation. In brief, for our viewers also, and uh, you had mentioned something like uh, you do not go back literature a uh, little uh, much way back. I would like to ask Dr. Venkatesh Babu, if we are talking about literature, research literature, mm -hmm. how do we know, how do we understand which uh, subjects, which topics, which titles we should choose from which year, Sarka, which, uh, from which time period? How do we know that? As Dr. Vivek said, don't go too far back. So what are, are there any guidelines for that? How do we do that? Generally, in that case, I prefer the recent five years is the better period. Okay. So that's why even for selecting the thesis topic for postgraduate students, they have to highlight more on the last five years. So in the last five years, they would have get a lot of gaps in their knowledge so that they can give answer for all those questions, the way of dissertation which they are doing. Thank you, sir. So uh, now we know we have so many equipment, material, instruments, micro instruments, everything. So a publication in 2020 by Bartols et al. has concluded a five-year survival rate without untoward events in non-surgical root canal treatments to be 73.9%. So how has the success rate of non-surgical endodontic treatment changed over time? Can I have the views from Dr. Narsimhan Bharadwaj and Dr. Vivek Egre too? Narsimhan, you want me to go first? Yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. All right. Uh, I hope you don't have more of me. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. So this is a good question about uh, success rate of non-surgical endodontic treatment. If you ask me the question, we all would want to say yes. That's the truth. But uh, let's be clear about a few things. In the past, there were only few studies done compared to the recent work where there are a lot of studies. The sample size in the earlier studies were only hundred or thousands. Today, if you see, there's a million of teeth have been worked, so there's a lot of studies. Even when you talk of studies, the recent studies in the recent past, like how Dr. Venkatesh told, it's going to be all meta-analysis, systematic review, randomized clinical studies, or cohort, or maybe retrospectives. These kinds of studies were not done 20 years back. You see, there are hardly any. Last 20 years, you've seen how science has progressed, how we have advanced. That's the reason I also feel like Venkatesh, that whenever the postgraduate takes up a study, let him not refer too far. Unfortunately, in the books, the question will still come in the paper, like final year papers, recent advances in, say, anything, 
will be say lasers. Laser is not recent. You have reference from 1980s. So, you know, that question also should be balanced in such a way. You can ask possibly what has changed in the recent times with respect to lasers or anything for that matter. So, coming to the point again, uh, old work was less, new work is more. So, it's like comparing apples and oranges. I don't want to go to that. So, today if you see, there are lots of variables what people look at. They look at protocols, they look at standard of care, they look at, say, working <coughs> protocols, working culture, newer advances, or maybe the study design itself. So we need to understand a few things. The word success is what not I'm liking. Instead of success, you know what we should write? I remember now 2004 article read by Friedman. He spoke about healing and healed. I think that's what we should talk about. Or if you go for references to see all the systematic reviews, a lot of articles from Gulabiwala or uh, Veselink or uh, Hage Shamesh or NG, so many are there. They spoke about success, somewhere they spoke about survival. My question to this is, when you talk of success rate of non-surgical, there are again parameters. Was it a first time treatment? Was it a repeat treatment in non-surgical? Was it a primary tooth? Was it an adolescent? Was it an adult or an geriatric tooth? All these, I'm sure uh, Vasudev and uh, Venkatesh can throw light into the same topic because the variables are too many. What I would like is, I don't like success because I told you the true meaning of definition in the Oxford uh, Dictionary says, success is nothing but accomplishment of uh, aim or purpose. What I am trying to tell you is, bacteria cannot be cleaned completely from the root canal system. We all know that. So if you see the literature, success rate is about 95% in the first times. In the repeat, it is about 75, 80, 83%. Lot of reviews we have seen on systematic. Just to conclude, I would say, I remembered any, uh, another article from Hage Shamesh, Shamesh and Veselink. They told that uh, the review of the follow-up should be done up to one year, then four years. Unnecessary retreatment should not be included in that. And a classical word I liked in that article was, use the word effective or ineffective. I think these are the words that can be used when it comes to uh, having a success or failure. Effective, ineffective, or like uh, Friedman said, uh, healed or healing. I think these are some of the good things to be used. But what I'd like to congratulate Venkatesh is, about the guidelines that he has brought or is still bringing. Because somehow, you know, the structured guidelines for a lot of protocols are not there. So what uh, Venkatesh, along with Paul Dummer and the whole team are doing is something very, very phenomenal. Congratulations, uh, Venkatesh. I like to see all that. And uh, I would pass on the mic to uh, Narsimhan here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, Vivek has answered this in a wonderful dimension of success rate of non-surgical endodontic treatment. Now, I like to answer the same question in a slightly different dimension of, let's say, for example, what are the indications for a periapical surgery? Now, say, for instance, if we have seen all the textbooks right from the days when we have done our undergraduation, you have a beautiful chapter called periapical surgery and now it's called microperiapical surgery. So there you have a list of big indications of what and all. It's about 8 to 10 indications are there in that. But if you see in the last at least uh, maybe about a dozen years, like in the last about a decade, uh, the, the, the rule the rule per se is any, any periapical lesion, Okay, I still remember. I still remember during the undergraduation days where how we were being explained that if you have an insignificant periapical lesion which measures less than five millimeters, so you call it as a periapical granuloma, and then if it is slightly increased in size, you call it as a periapical cyst with a white sclerotic border, and if the border is not there, you call it as a periapical abscess. So we still remember, like you know, the protocols being told to us that. If it is a periapical granuloma, you can think of a non-surgical retreatment, whereas if it is a periapical cyst, you can think of a periapical surgery. Right, ma'am? So now, all these concepts are completely out. All these concepts are completely out. 
Now the simple rule is, if you have a periapical lesion, forget about the size of the lesion, let it be as small as a granuloma, as, as huge as a periapical cyst. The rule of the thumb is you attempt a non-surgical retreatment. You blindly attempt a non-surgical retreatment. Where probably at the end, if we have time, I'll show you some of my clinical cases where classically indicated for a periapical surgery with a white sclerotic border and where you just in, attempt a periapical, I mean a normal retreatment and it heals. The white sclerotic border just disappears. So the, the, the earlier christening of calling a lesion based on the presence or the absence of a sclerotic border as a cyst, all that is actually losing momentum. So now the rule of the thumb is, the message which we have to imply is, any case with a periapical lesion has to be treated non-surgically. Wait and watched for a period of three to six months. If you feel the lesion is still enhancing in size, then you can go in for a periapical surgery. So the indications, to put it in a small nutshell, there are only two absolute indications for a periapical surgery. Number one, unresolving periapical pathology. I use the word unresolving periapical pathology, which means you have done the retreatment and still after three to six months, the pathology persists. And number two, separated instrument beyond the apical foramen and patient is symptomatic. So there are only two absolute indications for periapical surgery. All the rest of the situations which are mentioned in textbooks as periapical surgery can be treated non-surgically. Uh, sir, what about the size of the periapical lesion? Would yeah. you like to make a comment on that? Exactly. Irrespective of a size? That's precisely what I was telling you a few minutes before that. The size of the periapical lesion has got no role to play in deciding whether you need to incise or not incise. Even if it is, I mean, I, I, that's what I told you in the end, I'll show you a few cases of mine where uh, almost a big, small, uh, uh, lemon-sized lesions resolving without non-surgically. So now the question of like, when we see a big lesion, we need to open up, uh, do a, 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 a mass utilization or an enucleation. All those concepts are actually on the decline. And uh, regarding the uh, statement that you made about the separated instrument, yeah. If it is asymptomatic, we do not need to touch. If it is symptomatic, probably. Yes, yes. 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 So yes. If asymptomatic, it is... how do we handle that? Nothing at all. Just leave just it like that? Leave do it. Not... Just leave it like that. I'll, that's why I told you, I, I'll show you some cases, interesting cases. Yeah, where, yeah. surely uh, we'll have time for that. Where I'll show you instruments broken and it's like absolutely asymptomatic. So if there Definitely. is no symptoms beyond the apex, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Definitely, we'll come back uh, to that because our viewers will um, get enough of all that because they want to know clinical cases. And uh, Dr. Uh, Balal, may I ask, are you in concurrence with whatever Dr. Bhardwaj and Dr. Vivek Hegre said yeah, about this? Definitely. The healing yeah. or heal, not to use the term success. Uh, if you, on the evidence-based side, I think there are classical articles by Dr. Gulabiwala, what uh, Dr. Vivek has said. Uh, I think part one, part two is given in volumes, but uh, you really need a lot of patience because uh, Gulabiwala group, I'm not criticizing him, but he writes literature in an article. So you need a lot of patience to read that, but a postgraduate student, I think, have to read that. Then you will completely know what and all factors you need to see when you say a tooth is success, a root field tooth is success or a failure. It is not only a lesion or uh, you know fractured thing or anything, right from the systematic problems, right from the patient's systematic history, what disease he has, everything he has to need to be counted, accounted for. Uh, that is how you see it, this, I mean, root fill tooth, the success or failure. And coming on to, I just wanted to add one point for uh, what uh, Dr. Narasimhan has said. I had a case around, it is a couple around eight to nine years back, I have published in American Journal of Dent Dentofacial Orthopedics. It was a orthodontics. You know, one patient who came for orthodontic treatment uh, was, it is a very common trend, right? When the PG starts, half the way that PG will leave and other fellow will take, he'll tighten it and this is a common sequence. Yeah. So that patient developed a huge lesion with almost canine to canine resorption and a huge lesion and there is a vertical bone loss. So only my teacher, Dr. Case, but only one thing what he told is the miracle drug. I think everybody knows that, calcium hydroxide. It made wonders. Just put calcium hydroxide 
inside the root canal keep changing the dressing and if you see that case report i don't i have not bought any slides of it but it is available in the journal you can see there was a tremendous healing just with change of the intracanal calcium hydroxide so we never went for any surgery i think by now pgs will immediately you know they'll be so hyper to open up a periodontist will tell i need to do a flap and endodontist will tell i need to do an episectomy you know they'll be so hyper to do but we never did that so most of the cases can be treated non surgically by using intracanal medicaments it will it has done wonders that's what i want to say thank you thank you but i want to ask you you said keep changing the medical material how frequently what are the guidelines on those Uh, it depends again it depends upon the case to case because there was some old thoughts saying by uh, ostrovic and hapazolo telling that if you keep calcium hydroxide for a longer duration the tooth becomes weak it is absolutely not correct the study if you go through the study it was not done properly i am not one to comment that but there are so many other foreign people also who have commented on this there is nothing as such telling that if you keep calcium hydroxide for long it will be brittle and the study moreover was done on a bovine teeth but we are not using any bovine teeth so there are a lot of flaws in that study so what i am going to what i am saying is the calcium hydroxide it depends usually for 3 to 4 weeks we keep and we change the dressing we cannot keep it for longer duration because it gets diluted it get buffered by the root canal dentin so depending upon case to case we need to change the dressing thank you very much Ma'am, I have no. a small doubt. Can I ask uh, Dr. Ross? Definitely, yes, sir. Definitely. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely. Dr. Ross, sir, in that case, which do you think is the best vehicle to push your calcium hydroxide inside? Whether it's chloric acid, uh, saline, uh, or medicaments? Uh, uh, I use. I if you, yeah, Vitapex is a problem. Is the retrieval? Yeah. Okay. It's very difficult to retrieve because it's oily based. What I suggest is to mix calcium hydroxide with sodium hypochlorite. there are enough literature to say it is much much more better compared to distilled water because hypochlorite never compromises the action of sodium calcium hydroxide nor calcium hydroxide never compromises the action of sodium hypochlorite so these two i use in the clinics i combine these two and use but again it depends on case if you want for a longer duration you can go for a viscous vehicle like propylene glycol again in our college dr kesbert i think dr vivek knows that during his pg time a lot of studies has been done on calcium hydroxide and, and la was used as a vehicle yeah propylene glycol and calcium hydroxide it is published in some 80s journal in triplo so beautiful articles by dr kesbert and dr kamath etc so propylene glycol is also a wonder drug okay. if you want to use as a viscous vehicle but i suggest going for a sodium hypochlorite so you say the hypochlorite is better than chlorhexidine if you mix it with calcium hydroxide right yes i i don't have any literature to support chlorhexidine and okay. uh, calcium hydroxide but i have i use in clinics hypochlorite because based on the reference okay. based on the research evidence thank you thank you thank you so going a little drifted from what we were discussing initially when rotary systems were introduced the canal preparations were started directly with rotary instruments however now we mostly agree that getting to apex is best achieved when glide path is created and the apical size remains a problem since apical integrity has to be maintained as against circumferential removal of infected dentine could i have the views from dr venkatesh babu and dr gyanluka pratino on this Okay, so coming to now, I have a two question here. What is the apical master apical file size? It has to be small or large. It's a very controversy topic. The next topic is: Do we need glide path? Yes or no? For this question. So coming to the first question, generally, what is the role of instrumentation in reducing the microbial load? Generally, you have a two great studies by Jose Secura and Isabel Rosa. So this, they one recent study they made it as one samples they collected before instrumentation. That is S1. The next is first instrumentation followed by they collected a sample. So they collected the, what is the microbial load. Then they did second instrumentation. After third instrumentation, fourth instrumentation again they collected the bacterial load. This is S3. After the final rinse of hypochlorite again they collected the microbial load in this compared to s1 and s2 that is before starting instrumentation 
at the end of first instrumentation there is no difference in reduction of microbial load whereas there is a drastic reduction in the microbial load after you doing your instrumentation of size 3 and 4 so what i trying to say is once you do your instrumentation properly with three or four instrument automatically the bacterial load will decrease further you use your final rinse of hypochlorite again that hypochlorite will drastically reduce your microbial load so this particular study clearly showed the number of instrument is very important in reducing your microbial load again this study has been supported by two systematic reviews which got published in international endodontic journal the title is master epical file size smaller or larger they did in two parts in first part in the first part they did the systematic review including studies only concerned to the microbial reduction whereas the second part the same title master epical file size smaller or larger a systematic review based on healing outcomes in these two studies they concluded saying that your master epical file size has to be three size more than your initial epical file size i think still this theory holds good if you improve or increase your three size instrumentation more than your initial epical file size you are drastically you will improve your healing outcome so that is what one of the important success in root canal so i don't believe drastically in this minimal invasive procedure especially in the tooth with periapical pathosis and necrotic pulp so to conclude my statement is you have to increase your three size instrumentation so this is my answer for my first question coming to the next question is the glide path can you change to the next slide map yeah this is one of the paper which got published in uh, last month in journal of endodontics this review was written by Gian Luca, me, and few of our couples, couple of our friends like Frido and Hani and Gustavo. This is the one of the paper which I took. We took almost one year to write. It's very difficult. We have included 96 papers for included studies in the systematic review. This is only one half. The another half of the paper, Gian Luca has extremely shared his clinical views. How to, can you go to the next slide, ma'am, please? Um, oh, sorry. This yeah. is it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. In that another half of this slide, sorry, another half of the paper, he had clearly explained how to negotiate the canal with different angle of curvature. If it's abrupt, how to do that? If it's straight, if it's easily curved, it's difficultly curved. Everything he has clearly explained in this particular paper with a lot of clinical images and most of the CT images. So I request most of the postgraduate students or the clinical practitioners, please read this paper. It will 100% it will be useful for you guys. Coming to the glide path, I request Gyan Luka to have his views on that because he's the expert now. So he recently he wrote uh, one textbook on minimal invasive endodontics he wrote this particular chapter so i think he is the right person to highlight the students and everybody on this topic please gyan luka stage is yours thank you Anki. thank you Anki, for for introducing me on this topic and i agree very much with people who said before that uh, uh, we the success of endodontic treatment is mainly given by a, a good preparation of the apical third uh, if we are able to treat well um, in a predictable way, the apical third uh, and the, to disinfect it, it's, it's very important. So first of all, we have to reach the apical third with our instrumentation to, to, to then uh, deliver the irrigants there and all the, the treatment procedures. So the negotiation scouting and glide path is the, uh, one of the most important phases in the endodontic treatment because it permits us to reach the apical third, to reach the apical foramen and to, uh, and to clean these very important area. Um, in my clinical approach today, I have to say that uh, uh, um, a mechanical approach 
to dive tough into the, into the scouting and negotiation is something that is very successful in my clinical hands. This is because we are using flexible files like nickel like titanium files and to scout the most difficult topical anatomies, the nickel titanium flexible files, they are more indicated rather than the more rigid stainless steel files. We can use the small files for, for initial, uh, initial canal assessment, I like to, to call it, in, during negotiation. Because for me, using the number six, number eight hand file means not to try to create a glide path, but just to understand the, apical, the, the anatomy of the canal, to understand the inclination of the orifice, where the canal goes, if the canal is straight, curved, if the canal is strict or large. So initial canal assessment. Then most of the cases in our clinical practice, during this initial canal assessment, we are able to reach the apical foramen through the, these manual hand files under the apex locator. So these cases are quite easy in my clinical practice today because you can use the uh, mechanical file that you, that you prefer uh, in the correct way, following the, the, the indication of the manufacturers and treat these, these anatomies, even if even the most curved, very effectively because the, the modern instruments, they are, the, we have a lot of modern instruments, very effective and safe, and safe uh, to, to, to be used. The problem is when we are not able to negotiate the root canal to, during this initial canal assessment. In that case, I never push on my stainless steel files because they are rigid even in the smallest sizes, a 10, the 10 is already a rigid file. If you are using it, in a very difficult canal in which you are not able to proceed. So I never push on my stainless steel file and I start to use uh, mechanical techniques to try to scout the root canal. As, I have, as we all have described in this, in this review, uh, probably reciprocation has, uh, has given us this possibility to perform a mechanical scouting in a safer way because uh, uh, the rule for rotary files is obviously not to use a rotary file wh where you have not inserted an end file before because of the risk for fractured tips. With the reciprocation, we can change the approach because of the safety of reciprocation. We can try to scout the root canal with several different techniques in reciprocation. Small files for glide path or single file for coronal scouting. There are some situations in which we can directly go with the, with the mechanical files, especially in the most difficult root canals. And in my practice, choosing by different files used in reciprocation, I'm able to, uh, to find a solution for the most difficult cases, especially the most difficult cases when we have apical impediments or to the scouting with some files with some specific characteristics, we are able to, to reach the apex. When we have coronal impediments, we can use different type of files adapting to the anatomy. So the important, the important step for me, for the people is to start to have the knowledge of the different properties of the files and how to use them in the different clinical situations. Thank you, sir. But here, when you are scouting, is there any role of any chemical agent to do so while we are establishing the glide path? And as you mentioned, the initial canal assessment, how do we do that clinically? What would you tell our viewers that these are the steps we should follow while we are performing the initial canal assessment and the other part of the question that is the chemical agents, are they required? If yes, which are the ones? In my opinion, in this phase, it's not so much important to use a chemical agent because the canal is is so small that uh, you have no penetration of these agents inside the root canal. So we are speaking about diff canal with difficult scouting. So they are surely very small, strict canals. So it's very difficult. In any case, if I, if I have a pre-enlargement of the coronal portion, for example, and I have some difficulties, the only chemical agent that I use is a liquid EDTA. So a liquid chelating agent to, to try to scout the apical turn, but usually, in, it does not make the difference. I don't use gels or other chelating agents like this. In, it's, not, it's not needed anymore with the, in this step, but also with the mechanical files, it's, it's not needed. For the initial canal assessment, uh, okay, uh, I can suggest to start, uh, depending on the, the dimension of the root canal, if it's a single rooted tooth or, or a multi-rooted tooth, 
to start with small stainless steel files like size eight uh, if in a multi-rooted tooth or size 10 in a single rooted tooth with a single canal, just to understand the dimensions of the canal, the, the directions of the canal curvature, the, uh, the characteristic of the canal. So I, I like the, the size eight because it's difficult to make damages with the size eight, while it's very easy to make damages with size 10 and size 15. So size eight, if you try to push it, the tip is easily, you can easily bend the tip. So uh, it's, it's not so easy to create damages. So I, I always start with this file for the initial canal assessment. And if, if I'm not able to follow, to, to reach the glide path, I stop with the end files and I start with the mechanical files as soon as is possible. Thank you, sir. And if I may ask you, what can be the predictable uh, markers or predictability markers? Sorry, the predictable? Predictability markers. Can we define or can we square down to some predictability markers that if we are doing this, yes, we will achieve this? Predictability. Is it's, it's, very diffi it's very difficult because the root canal anatomy is so variable that it's impossible to give a standardization. I have done a, a retrospective analysis of my clinical cases in the last five to 10 years. And I have to say that 85% uh, of the canals, we are able to reach the apex with our initial canal assessment. So I, I classify this canal in easy canal because we are able to establish easily the negotiation and the glide path and then use an, any rotary or reciprocating file we want. In the other 15% of the cases, we have difficulty to scouting and we have to use specific strategies. Thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Uh, Babu. Uh, yeah, I have one more doubt. Uh, I think Vivek sir and Arasimhan sir or Gyanluka can add your views on this. What is the role of file six size and eight? These two files has to, is an important or mandatory file for moderate and severe curvature tooth or you can avoid those files for moderate curvature, file size six and eight? Uh, I have to say the more difficult is the canal, the more important is to use a mechanical instrumentation with uh, more flexible nickel titanium files. So for me, the eight and the six uh, stainless steel hand files, they are important, I repeat, for the initial canal assessment. They are not important for me for managing the different type of curvatures. Because the, the, the most useful files uh, for managing the most difficult canals and the most difficult curvatures are the nickel titanium mechanical files because they are more flexible, they are using mechanically, so more easily they follow the original path of the original root canal anatomy without uh, risking or with less risk to create uh, an, an impediment, a blockage, a ledge. Uh, obviously, the, the drawback of mechanical files may be the risk for fracture that has been almost completely reduced by the introduction of reciprocation. reciprocation. So I suggest also to read the, our review on reciprocating instruments that we have published in two parts in 2015 on the Journal of Endodontics. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, Thank you. <coughs> okay. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Good, good. Thank you. Yeah, Vintage, for the question you asked, I think it's very important. Uh, if you want me to put a clinical perspective with this, I think Gyanluka has spoke very well. So I would put it this way. I would want to see we are working on a 2D picture of a 3D object. The problem starts there. So I want a student or a young doctor who is yet to come into good practice to classify their case. A simple case, a not so simple, and a not at all simple case. By doing this, you can see what file fits you. A simple case, you can possibly start with a 10 number file or a 15 number, a K file, a stainless steel file, a must. A not so simple will definitely be 10 and not even 15. But not at all simple, cannot be even 10. It has to be eight minimum, like what uh, Gyanluka said. So, Dr. Vitek, let's try, to, let's try to ask your student to, to, to use my classification of clinical cases. Mm -hmm. uh, starting with the eight, you can classify easy case when the eight can reach easily the working length or difficult case where it cannot reach the working length. That's, that's my... Uh, clinical way to classify these cases because <clears throat> if not, you have to measure so many parameters on, on a theory, theoret only theoretical base 
uh, while I, I'm more, I, I think I, I, this is more practical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Yes. But the idea of these files, he said about stainless steel, perfectly fine because you need to pre curve the file sometimes. If you have to remember uh, Herbert Schilder, he gave a classical statement. You know what he told? He told a straight file in the root canal is a dumb file. You want an intelligent file, you pre curve it. A very classical statement told by him. Or if I have to remember another uh, a statement by Richard Munz, he told what? I want to register the impression of the canal. Because, because it's a 2D picture, you get to see the mesial and the distal side, or maybe the top and the bottom, that's crown and the root. <coughs> you don't get to see the buccolingual view. When you put a file into the canal and you take it out and you relate it to that particular tooth next to the canal, it will give you the curvature that it travels to the buccal or lingual up to where it's gone. That's how you would possibly advance scouting down deep the way it goes. So I would totally agree with what Gyanlaka told. It's truly correct. So for everybody, just go step by step and with the smaller files only. Towards the end, I want to just say one point and close the case. I know people want to use rotaries or reciprocation without hand. For me, if hand files do not, rotary files cannot. cannot. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, a clear consensus is emerging now that we need to classify our cases, simple, complex, not so complex, and hand files, the smaller ones, six, eight, are indispensable. So, can we now go on to uh, something which is related, the role of chelating agents in cleaning the root canal system. Can I have Dr. Ballal's view on this? Yeah, uh, so we know that when we mechanically shape the root canal system, there will be something called as a formation of a smear layer. So to get rid of the smear layer, we need to use a proteolytic agent and a chelator. That is where the role of chelator comes in endodontics. So if you see the literature, there's a plethora of studies on a lot of chelators. But the commonest used by most of the endodontists is EDTA. However, I am not a big fan of EDTA because I have done extensive study on uh, chelator during my PhD days. And I can give you around 10 to 12 disadvantages of EDTA. But even though it is gold standard irrigant chelating agents, it is used in endodontics, but it has got a lot of drawbacks. To name few, one thing is they say it removes smear layer. But if you see a 3D image in apical third, it hardly removes anything. Very, very difficult to remove apical third smear layer using an EDTA one. Second thing, now time for a clinicians, time is gold, right? Time is money, right? So you need to minimize the number of irrigants what we use. So now the concept which has come is to minimize the irrigant and go for a dual rinses where you can combine one or two irrigants more. But EDTA, you cannot combine. Commonly, if you combine EDTA with the sodium hypochlorite, you know the action of sodium hypochlorite is reduced. That is two. Third thing is the in thing now in obturation is using the resin materials. So resin sealers. So it is shown there is evidence, research evidence to show that EDTA inhibits the bonding of resin materials. Also, a lot of bioactive materials have come in now for obturating, biodentin, so many ceramic cement, everything. And EDTA is all against all this. It doesn't work. So now the in concept is something called as a continuous chelation. So for this, what a lot of studies, what they have done is they have used a soft chelator, which is called as a hydroxyethylene bisphosphonate, HEDP, which can easily go hand in hand with sodium hypochlorite. So there are a lot of studies by, again, Teresa et al, where they have combined hypochlorite with the HEDP. But recently, a product by Dr. Matthias Zender, who is my mentor and a great friend from uh, University of Zurich, he's come up with a patent of dual rings HEDP. It comes in capsule. 0.9 gram capsule of HEDP. You just open up the capsule, put in the hypochlorite, 10 ml of hypochlorite, stir it properly and you can use it. So you can, by using this, it will be something called as a continuous chelation. That is throughout the instrumentation, you can use this combination of irrigant. That is a combination of hypochlorite as well as a HEDP. Me and Dr. Math, we have done a lot of studies. One first clinical trial we have done on HEDP and it is published in IEJ last year. So it showed very good effectiveness on eradication of the microbial load from the root canal system. So if you ask me, if you want to use an EDTA, it is a strong chelator, 
but there are other beta chelator for example i can give you is a malic acid because i have worked my phd on this malic acid and i found it to be a very much promising agent but again remember it is a strong chelator it is not a soft chelator it is quite aggressive but advantage of this is it removes the smear layer much much effectively compared to edta and it is non toxic edta is known to be toxic so in case if you extrude it beyond then you are done so all those disadvantages when you compare malic acid is better but only thing is it is again aggressive so if you want to go for a soft chelator according to me hydroxyethylene bisphosphonate is the best i think i can take the opinion of dr vivek yeah thank you very much actually when you mentioned time is gold for clinicians i could see dr vivek is working <laughs> so sir your take on this that's really true and uh, well spoken uh, was there i totally agree but uh, when students talk of chelating agents they will definitely think of uh, yeah. the EDTA. viscous type not the aqueous so it starts from the gel paste and cream suppose so unfortunately i know there are urea peroxide or carbamide peroxide mixed agents earlier they were used a lot i heard gianluca telling that uh, he doesn't use at all which also is true partially because it interferes with the hypochlorite action it came in because in the earlier books from what cohen had written he told it emulsifies it does flotation it does suspension of that pulp that is 60% in collagen it will prevent the collapse of the pulp and all those theories come so even if there are clinicians who want to use it use it for the first two files at the top but definitely not at the apical third because the biggest problem of such is it's a binder it binds into the pulp and you can end up having dentine pulp complex as apical hard tissue debris so what coming short from there i would prefer a viscous chelator like what gyanluka said what uh, vasudev exactly told about continuous chelation because today we want to have combinations where detergents or wetting agents or emulsifiers or lubricants are taken what he was talking of mathias in the paper is like ethetronic acid that's come into this you can have longer duration of work 25 30 minutes with the hypochlorite action you will have no erosion as much even in india the product is available earlier it was in a liquid form where you have to mix two liquids called chloroquick now you have a twin clean as a capsule we can break the capsule use the hypochlorite you have and make it the most important advantage is what like what vasudev said it's about the ph personally as a clinician for a long years i didn't know about this i was ignorant but today i definitely will definitely agree with vasudev what he has told about the ph it plays a bigger role so continuous chelation is the way forward as we look now thank you thank you very much so uh, we got to know some new things that's very very important and continuous chelation and the new agents as you said the soft ones not so soft ones so now we have a balance between what is theoretical and what is practically achievable so thank you very much now uh, we have addressed the simple straight canals round cross section these can be addressed easily by mechanical instrumentation and irrigation but what about the aberrations like oval canals curved canals isthmi magnification is there it is helping us to detect anatomical variations more so what may be the means to perform mechanical instrumentation in such cases to achieve the larger goal of root canal disinfection and here i would uh, like the expert to also comment certain things on the other irrigants for example we have discussed sodium hypochlorite what other irrigants which might facilitate obturation leading to predictable treatment outcome could i have the views from dr balal and dr nasiman bhargavaj on this yeah yeah thank you ma'am uh, nalsiman should i take it yeah you, you can take the theoretical part i'll just uh, first put my the clinical uh, part and then i think you will have a lot to say okay. now as far as uh, can we have the question yeah 
So now, yeah. as far as this is concerned, from the purely, I, I'm sure Dr. Vasudeva is going to take it from the research perspective. Now, I'll first take it from the clinical perspective. Now, from the clinical perspective, the most important thing as of now, as far as this question is concerned, is every endodontist should shift over to ultrasonics. An ultrasonic method, what I mean is by using a Statex or by, by using a slow speed, is the way forward to achieve these goals of clearing the isthmus or tracing the MB2s or kind of like, you know, even de-roofing for that matter. When with, with magnification and ultrasonic, these mechanical preparation, because why, why I want to insist on that is the moment we hear the word mechanical preparation, one thing which goes into our mind is we just think that is just burr and rotary file. You'll have to understand that mechanical preparation is not just burr and rotary file. So the burr, in fact, the current concept is the burr is used only for the drop and then just a little bit of an expansion. And then all the rest is got about by the use of ultrasonics coupled with magnification. So this, in fact, I first learned with Dr. Vivek when I went to his place about uh, almost six years back. When I, and, the, and when I came back, the first thing which I bought was uh, the ultrasonic scale. I don't know whether he remembers that. I, in fact, told him as well. So now I, I cannot imagine to do a root canal without my ultrasonics. The moment I open my access, I shift over to my ultrasonics and then I do my predominant preparation of the pulp or I mean of the uh, chamber or the isthmus and everything with ultrasonic preparation. This is from a clinician mechanical perspective. Now Dr. Vasudev will highlight about the research perspective of that. Yeah, thank you Dr. Nasiman. Uh, this is a big issue when we treat a ribbon shaped canal or an oval shaped canal. So what type of instrumentation we need to do? So if you ask me, there should be some files which will just scrape and don't cut because mesial roots, for example, mesial rules of a lower mandibular molar where isthmus is present, the dimension of the root will be very thin. So we need some files which can scrape the matrix of the biofilm from the root canal wall. And one of the classical example, what I can give for this is the XP endofinisher. So recently I have done a clinical trial. It is a first clinical trial in the endodontic literature on XP endofinisher. It is uh, published in uh, Journal of Dentistry. It is coming next month. So me and Dr. Dummer have done that. We saw for the effectiveness of XP endofinisher. And as Dr. Narasimhan said, ultrasonics with F file. F file is one more plastic file, which can just agitate the root canal irrigate. So we compared all this and we saw XP endofinisher was in par with ultrasonics. So one main advantage of this XP endofinisher is it doesn't cut. It just scrubs the wall so that the biofilm will get de detached, especially in case of a oval canals where the rotary instrument does not touch the walls. That is one. Second thing, there was some time back a file called as a uh, I'm not getting uh, self-adjusting file, SAF. Yeah. SAF had come again, but I don't think, I think it's not existing now if I'm not uh, mistaken. So even they tried with SAF, but the research evidence showed that it again rubs the wall and there is some formation of a heart tissue debris. But the advantage of SAF was there was a continuous irrigation along with the scrubbing action, but it do produces the uh, heart tissue debris, which was again difficult to remove. So right now, XP endofinisher is doing well. There are enough uh, in vitro studies for removal of the debris, for removal of the bacterial content, for dislodgement of the biofilm, for removal of the calcium hydroxide when you place as intracanal medicament. There are a lot of studies on uh, XP endofinisher. And we have done a clinical study again, which showed which is in par with the ultrasonics. So this is my view on cleaning of a oval shaped canal. And something on the type of irrigants. Uh, see, choice when, of irrigants rather. Choice of irrigant, again, the first choice is always sodium hypochlorite. So sodium, we know, I don't think anybody can replace sodium hypochlorite in anodontics. So we need to use sodium hypochlorite during instrumentation. Then the question comes only the final flush. So which irrigant of choice we you want to use as a final flush? Again, it can be a single irrigant or it can be dual rinse. So there are different dual rinse in the market. For example, Qmix. Again, we have done a lot of studies on Qmix, smear off, the recent which has come, and erythrol. So these three are the dual rings, what we call, which has a combination of uh, EDTA and chlorhexidin in it. But uh, smear off, I had done first study on smear off on removal of uh, smear layer in root canal system. It was very efficient in removal of the heart tissue debris. But I have not done any study on uh, antimicrobial efficacy. But the erythrol, our PGs have done a lot of study, but it was not great. 
but only thing that what the company says the erythrol is green color liquid so that you can easily identify but its efficiency in removal of smear layer was not great so the only issue comes when you use a final rinse which type of chelator you want to use one thing second thing if you are using a reinfected case or a infected case you can go with this dual rinse which has got a chlorhexidine even though chlorhexidine does not have a big role in anodontics now still it is shown very effective against e fecalis there is enough amount of literature regarding that so you can use a final rinse of this dual rinse irrigants which are present as a final flush that is what i feel thank you very much it's a very clear and uh, nicely explained i'm sure the audience they will have very many take home messages from this and now may i ask regarding the effect of speed and torque on the efficiency of endodontic instruments uh, can dr uh, gianluca pitino and dr nasiman bharadwaj comment on this because instrument fracture what to use so many endodontic motors so again we are uh, flushed with an array of instruments equipment drivers how to choose what to choose where to be careful could i have our views for okay if i can start I have to say on this topic yes. that I can. Yes, you can start, I, I can easily finish very fast because in my clinical practice, I'm almost uh, every time using reciprocating movement. Even uh, instruments marketed to be used in rotary motion, I am using in reciprocation. So, speed and torque is not a, a is not a very big, very important. Uh, topic when we speak about reciprocation and reciprocating movements, because most of these movements are already uh, already made by the manufacturers. So, and and in any case, in the present motor, you can you can control something on the speed, something on the angles, but it's not so much important. Uh, so, for me, uh, reciprocation overcome this problem any time. For what concern the rotary files. I have to say that for me, it's much more important how much an instrument is effective in cutting. Torque is is not a matter, or is a very is a very reduced matter if the instruments that we are using is very effective in cutting because you don't need uh, to control so much the torque because you are cutting dentin and the tip of the instruments will. Uh, never stop inside the root canal, inside the dentin. So we don't need so much torque. So if you have a an effective file, I like to use the highest torque possible. Uh, the torque is, is, uh, has come with the torque control motors to overcome a limit of the instrument. The limit of the instruments in that moment was the very low cutting ability. So that's it. Today we have a lot of very uh, effective files, so the torque is not more a matter, even more if we are using a, a reciprocating file. For what concerns the speed, I am a little bit, uh, I have a little different opinion rather than what is going on to the market. Uh, the market is, is going on uh, increasing the, the speed uh, to be used with files up to 1000 or even more. Uh, probably this is because we these files need a higher speed to compensate a reduced effic efficiency in cutting. But in my, I don't like to use a higher so high speed because uh, I, I lose the, con the tactile control on these instruments. And I'm a really big fan of lower speed. For me to use uh, normal speed to be used at this 300, but I also use 150 to 200 to have a better control when I have a very difficult apical curvature, for example, and I'm using a rotary file. So I'm uh, a bit um, going on the opposite of the market trend by suggesting the use of uh, reduced speed with really high efficient files to have a better control and better tactile sense on this instrumentation. But for me, everything is, is, can be overcome by the use of reciprocation. Thank you. Dr. Badwaj. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, before I answer this, I just want to have a quick question to Gianluca. Uh, yes. You mentioned about that you will also be using your root file, the reciprocation motion. Uh, now, if you see, the rotary files are actually manufactured to cut in the clockwise direction and the reciprocation files are manufactured to cut in the counterclockwise direction. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are going to use a rotary file in the reciprocation motion, how can you expect it to cut in the opposite direction? 
There are a lot of motors on the market that has a reciprocating motion on the clockwise directions. So you have just to choose a motor that has in, this, in, the, in its setting the possibility to, to set a reciprocating motion in the clockwise direction and you can use any file that, you, that is on the market. Okay. Okay, and then what about the rake angle? Because the rake angle, there is a slight difference between the reciprocation and the rotary. So if a rotary file is used in a reciprocation motion, even in the clockwise direction, do you feel that the engagement is going to be more considering the fact that the, the clearance angle will be different compared to a, a dedicated reciprocating file and a file? Like, let's say, for example, I'll give you an, uh, if I'm using a pro taper gold in the positive reciprocation file, it will not have a clearance angle at all. So there is going to be a continuous reciprocation. Do you think the file is going to withstand that? Yes, you, have, you can adapt your reciprocating movement by, uh, by choosing the angles and the speed. In any case, I suggest, uh, in this case, you, you need to, to have a, a very enhanced uh, knowledge of the properties of the different files to use them uh, not as in the indication of the of the manufacturer. So uh, obviously, your your uh, speech is, is correct. Rotary files uh, probably they work better in in rotation rather than yes. reciprocation because they are not constructed to be to go in in reciprocation. But there are some rotary files that I'm presently using very much, and they work very well also in reciprocation. Uh, but you need the knowledge on this on this. Can you just tell to, me what are the up. files, just for my knowledge, I do not know uh, which rotary files you can use in reciprocation. Any examples? You have, uh, yes, you look I, I, I like to use the most modern rotary files like a rotate file. I don't okay. know if you already have in India. Uh, the rotate file is uh, like the evolution of the M2 file. For example, the M2 file is not so good to be used in reciprocation because of its design. Yes. But the rotate, the rotate file with this new metal treatment and its design is fantastic for, to be used as an intermediate file for the, in, in an extended sequence in reciprocation. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that information. That is information to me. Yeah, now just to answer this question quick, since we are running short of time, yeah. <laughs> now, as far as speed and torque is concerned, uh, I, would, I would just give just one few things. One is, as Vivek aptly said in the beginning, uh, if a size, I always say, if a size 10 file is not reaching the apical foramen, no file in the universe will reach. Forget about the fact how much speed and how much torque you're going to use. So the most important thing which would determine a speed and the torque is to have a reproducible glide path. If you have a good reproducible glide path, then I think any file will work absolutely fine as per the manufacturer's guidelines. Now to answer the question of speed, uh, Gian Luca was talking about uh, using in lesser speed, but sometimes what happens when you use in very less speed, what happens when you increase the torque, the binding is going to be more. And as a result of the speed, what will happen? the speed at which it will clear the binding is also going to be lesser, which can result in a separation. So I would say the ideal speed would be 300 to 500. Nothing less than 300 and nothing more than 500. And if you just see across spread in the market, whatever rotary files that have come are coming and are going to come, the speed will be between 300 to 500. So invariably we stuck to the speed. And uh, torque is again, is just con it's just a, uh, 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 there is nothing like uh, this torque or that torque. It is just resistance to your lateral movement. So when you're going to push it inside, and as Vivek said, as gentle as possible, as gentle as possible. So when you're going to be gentle, and if you feel that it is going to be resisting, you can always increase the torque. And if it is going to be going comfortably in the most gentle pattern, I think the torque is just enough. So there is nothing like uh, uh, for uh, this file, this torque. I always work on the canal, the feel of the canal. In fact, I always say like what he said in the beginning, uh, when we spoke about how the beginner should adapt, I always say that dentistry and root canal and rotary is inherited skill. Nothing is, I mean, is, is completely, I'm sorry, is acquired skill. Nothing is inherited. Because I see a lot of endodontists, young budding endodontists say that, sir, uh, your handwork is good, sir. My handwork is not good. There is nothing like that. There is nothing like that. If you're going to continuously do, let me tell you, even a donkey's hand will perform the same thing. It's not a big deal at all. So dentistry and rotary especially is nothing but acquired skill, as Vivek pointed out. So as you keep working, 
Okay, in fact, if you ask uh, uh, people like us, like who have been 20 years into practice, many a times, many a times I've had this gut feeling. When the file goes inside the canal and when I feel, my gut tells me uh, somehow I, I might break the file and exactly that's the time when I break the file. So it kind of gives signals onto my fingers. That's the kind of tactile because a lot of people say that if you use rotary, you lose tactile feeling. I beg to differ. You can actually feel the rotary file in your fingers and that is when you actually get the tactile sense into your finger. I'm sure Vivek will accept on that. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, so tactile, 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 we agree on this. And uh, as uh, rightly pointed out, our viewers have been with us for more than, uh, it's two hours, 10 minutes now. So we'll just rush through a last question from here. And then we go on to clinical thesis and audience questions. Because somebody is working very hard uh, backstage, Dr. Laura Mishra, she's taking in all the audience questions and she has worked very hard. And the man behind the show, Dr. Mohan Bhuvneshwaran, my sincere thanks to him also for creating this platform. So we have had so many discussions. Can I just have this particular last question answered from here for the benefit of our postgraduate students and young researchers? What is the way forward? Can I have Dr. Venkatesh Babu's opinion? And then all the respected panelists, they can give certain tips so that we move on to clinical cases and uh, audience questions which have not been answered. Uh, as I know, this is the wonderful question which is very important for the postgraduate, especially on the young researchers. How, what is the future directions in research perspective in endodontics. For past six months, me and Prof. Paul Dummer and a couple of senior personalities in endodontics wrote three editorials. So I recommend the postgraduates to please read those three editorials. Number one, we wrote on how to improve the quality of randomized trials in endodontics. This is number one. Number two is animal testing. So how you have to do your animal experiments. Number third is a very important, which most of us we are planning to do in our thesis dissertation is laboratory based. So coming to the laboratory based studies, this editorial was written by me, Peter Murray, Ronald, O.A. Peters, Rokas, and Joe Secura and Prof. Paul Dummer. In this editorial, we wrote five to six sentences I would like to read here. Researchers and clinicians working in the field of endodontology by their very nature are intelligent, independent, bold, resourceful, and very likely overworked, underfunded, and underpaid. I think everybody accepts this. Nevertheless, it must be acknowledged that the majority of the research in endodontology begins and ends within a laboratory. Meaning that after all the time and effort producing the laboratory results, those results will never benefit a single patient who is given the endodontic therapy or indeed any dental treatment. So what we are trying to say is laboratory studies should not die within the laboratory. So while selecting the topic, please make sure your topic should have some clinical translation so that the whole you as well as the endodontic fraternity and the endodontic patients will be benefited by your laboratory results. So that's why I recommend, please read this last five years of paper, make sure the clinical relevance has to be there and try to pick up what is the gaps in the knowledge then try to address those knowledge. The next is, once you finalized your topic, you have four important domains, according to me, that is the four dimensions which you have to think about it. Number one, what is your specimens? For example, you are planning to do your experiment in your glass slides or tooth samples. In case if you are selecting tooth samples, you have to make a note on what is the age of your tooth. It plays a key role in bacterial and all those things. Same way, what is the curvature and radius of your curvature? Again, if you're planning to select something related to instrumentation, these two parameters play a key role. Then 
take something little bit higher end thing for example various anatomical variations today we discussed about isthmus so you can give the clear idea to the audience for example if you select isthmus tooth this will be the better for isthmus tooth the next is how next second domain is outcome measure how are you going to measure your outcome so please try to select the methodology which gives you conclusive evidence for example for any antimicrobial part please take sicon focal or real time pcr so you can give a conclusive evidence rather than if you take cfu or agar diffusion method you have to write in your conclusion saying that within the limitation so and so is your conclusion future direction i have to do it with my viability by confocal or real time pcr so please try to reduce your limitations by using your higher end methodology the next is the content for example if you are taking the microbiology don't try to use your planktonic cells you can use that for your preliminary report as a pilot study then please try to go a little bit higher biofilm is the mandatory again you have mono species dual species more related to clinical relevance again try to use your multi species biofilm then coming to the next is selection of your organism please don't focus only efficalis because if you think that efficalis is bread and butter of an endodontist no please read the current microbiological papers please take the organisms which is more recent and more important for endodontic failure the next is please maintain the perfect microbial conditions for example the paper says efficalis need 21 days to grow the biofilm please stick on to this 21 biofilm don't try to use 20 days 20 days or 19 days the last domain which i would like to focus is student has to be very clear on how you are going to conduct your experiment right from your sample size calculation how it's going to randomize who is going to do blinding process who is going to perform your experiment and make sure you use your appropriate statistical tools so these are all the domains i'm giving this overview so according to your research and your field of interest you have to flex so, but this is the basic domain which i can think at right now thank you golden words spoken out now dr ballal a brief uh, something for our young audience yeah. young researchers pg students uh, i think uh, 95% or 98% dr venkatesh babu has said i guess i don't think we may have to pitch in much but what i want to say is when you do a research it is not only doing research it has got two components you need to do the study and you need to publish it if you don't publish your thesis on any research work however good it is it is of a waste uh, there is a great saying by one of the st stalwarts of uh, harvard university george whiteside he said if your research cannot generate any paper it is might well equivalent to be not to be done so according to me you need to do a good research as dr venkatesh babu has already said what and all criteria <coughs> along with that you need to publish it so see that when you do any part of a research that it be a pg or let it be a faculty you need to publish it in somehow in a good or a bad journal one so when you say what type of research according to me three points because i do a lot of reviews and uh, i reject a lot of papers also it is very to sad to say that but problem is one thing there is no novelty in your study whatever study you do there should be some novelty don't try to reinvent the frame or reinvent the wheel again there should be something new there's no point doing the same thing which somebody has done and you are carrying some more parameter for that and finishing it off a study for the heck no there should be something novel second thing it should have a rationale because most of the papers gets rejected in a good journal because there is a lack of rationale there is no point doing that study it clearly says especially this our thesis which comes for a uh as a review paper it outright get rejected because there is no rationale in that two third thing as dr venkatesh said there should be some clinical impact so when you plan your study see that something clinical impact is there uh, rather than just taking some dye putting it on dentin and checking for the ph it doesn't matter there are enough dyes which says the what is the ph of a root canal dentin there is no point you adding one more dye into the dentin and telling okay this can be used so there is no clinical impact at all i am just giving an example so see that your study or a research project whatever you do do have some clinical impact and you are going to give something for the endodontic community this is what i want to say in a nutshell
Thank you very, very much. Bang on novelty, rationally, and clinical impact. Definitely. So if our respected panelists would like to add to this, uh, you're most welcome. If not, uh, then I think Dr. Laura is waiting with the audience questions which have not been answered and then we are all waiting for, to see the clinical cases. So would anybody like to add something to this? Whatever has been said, the way forward for the researchers. Uh, I would like to just add that we need, uh, we need uh, uh, clinical results in, in our studies. So we need to perform clinical studies to investigate the primary outcome in endodontics, the success rate. So this is very important. But then I agree with Venki 100%. And I would like to add that we need some uh, mentors like Venki that will be able to teach these techniques and how to perform these studies to the students to, per to, to, to spread out the knowledge of the research. True. As teachers, we also need to upgrade ourselves because we have to show the way. If we do not know, probably it might be very difficult for us and we are misguiding. As uh, Dr. Balal said, why are you adding another dye? I mean, what is the rationale? So that's uh, very correctly mentioned. Exactly. Dr. Like, uh, Dr. Vasudev, as like what Dr. Vasudev was telling, since they are all at the, uh, the helm of affairs where they can hold the mantle by guiding the PGs, the way forward should be clinical, clinical, and clinical. Because as Venkatesh said, if you don't have a clinical dimension to it, the whole purpose of uh, thing is lost. In fact, we had an informal chat with Laura and uh, you, ma'am, a few days back where I was just telling yes. you that uh, sometimes it so happened when we, it's very uh, uh, disappointing to see the PGs drifting away. They have so many conferences, so many journal clubs, so many things to attend. And at the end of three years, they finished their part one, part two, thesis, LD, uh, this many papers. And at the end, when I asked them, how do you do a retreatment? They scratch their head and like, they don't know how to do a, a good retreatment. So, uh, uh, I mean, very important is research. I don't deny that. But research cannot undermine clinical aspect in any way. It should only complement it. Because primarily what we are doing, as Venkatesh said, should benefit the patient community. If you don't benefit, there's no point in doing the research. This is my view because I'm a 100% clinician. Sorry about that. Thank you. No, no. So Thank much, you. Uh, Dr. Hegde. Yeah, I'd like to just uh, put very brief comments here. I think uh, the others have spoken elaborately. But uh, what they said is very true. A lot of studies are bench top studies. And we are trying to correlate to clinical conditions. There is no simulation. You're trying to simulate something. It should be as close as to animal studies, to human studies if possible. So long-term longitudinal studies are so little here. There's no stricter evaluation criteria with us. Like if you're talking of a bio model, the simulation of the biofilm model itself has not been studied. Or if you're talking of uh, anything like a confocal laser scanning microscope, I think you can go deeper to see the quantitative, the qualitative, the live, the dead. Such studies are not taken up so much as I would say, you know. So I think we should go, or if you're doing an irrigation study, the delivery of the irrigation is spoken, but how we spoke about complexity of case. Why can't we make models that have got like isthmuses or, you know, I know it's difficult to standardize. Like how Venkate said, even the age of the tooth is a big factor. I agree on that. But eventually you'll end up taking the simplest tooth to do some study. So I think these are a few of the stricter criteria for evaluation for the study that needs to be taken. So I think with this, I think uh, the pointers I put are very valid and must be taken up well. Also. Thank you. Yeah. Most certainly, most certainly, all the points very important. Uh, now you have added biomodel and clinically relatable studies. So uh, now that we are done here, uh, if I could ask Dr. Laura Mishra, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, Dr. Vivek can start discussing his clinical cases. In the meanwhile, can we just take a few questions from the audience because I think we've had them to their seats for two hours, 20 minutes now. Uh, so, Dr. Thank Laura. Thank you so much, ma'am. After all, we are doing this panel discussion for the interest of the audience and the students. So, answering the questions to the audience is equally important. Well, I have a very interesting share of questions. Uh, I know, Gyan Lukas, sir, you have to leave early, so I'll push it really uh, fast. I'll try to make it as fast as possible. And uh, my request to the panelists is to keep the answers brief and to the point. So, I'll go ahead. The first question I will direct to Venkatesh, sir. 
the calcium hydroxide can penetrate to 400 micrometers into dentinal tubules. What is the best efficient method for removing calcium hydroxide from dentinal tubules? Yeah, the thing is once you place your calcium hydroxide in the next visit, you have to use your rotary instrument to remove your calcium hydroxide plus use your chelating agent plus use your ultrasonic irrigation. So this will be the best protocol to retrieve your calcium hydroxide for that. Okay, sir, since we uh, regularly discussed and Vasudev Balal, sir, you, in, uh, you uh, insisted that uh, the hypochloride is the main irrigating of choice and though EDT is not an irrigation of choice, but usually the clinical protocol which is followed by most of the clinician is they use hypo, saline, EDTA, saline and then hypo. So what is the role of chlorhexidine? Where does chlorhexidine come? Uh, if you ask me, chlorhexidine does not have a big role in endodontics. I know some people do use chlorhexidine, but the main problem of chlorhexidine is it does not act on the matrix of uh, biofilm of the whatever microorganism is formed. Because our aim is to use something alkalizing agent. The classical example is sodium hypochlorite, which can dissolve the matrix of the biofilm. So uh, chlorhexidine, it is just antibacterial. It has got a dual action. It is antibacterial. So you can use it as a final rinse but it won't dissolve the matrix of the biofilm unlike sodium hypochloride. No harm in using, but there's no much benefit. So sir, then now uh, I see many studies on Cheetosan. So what is the role of Cheetosan? Uh, Cheetosan, it is a delivery agent. The main role, if you see before dentistry, there are a lot of studies on pharmacy, which has been done. It is, it is a very good polysaccharide and it is very good delivery agents. So now in endodontics, I think Dr. Anil has done a lot of work on uh, chitosan using nano deliveries, I mean nanoforms. So it can be used in nanoform as a delivery agent and it can, it has also been tried as a root canal irrigant as a, for removal of smear layer, but it was nothing as great as compared to other strong chelators. So as a delivery agent, if you want to use chitosan, it is one of the best polysaccharide. Okay, so I have a question. Uh... In case there is a periapical lesion which is large enough and which has involved cortical plate, say palatal defect, it has led to a palatal defect, would you still insist on a non-surgical treatment and, or you will follow wait and watch policy and decide on surgical options later? Vivek, sir. Uh, any treatment that I do, we have a principle in our practice. We want to do a follow-up of three months, six months, nine months and 12 months. We have read in the literature for anything good and bad to happen, it takes four weeks to 12 weeks for a lucency to come or a opacity to happen. No, so if I know if it's behaving well, I don't mind waiting. However, we would want to explain to all our patients the sequelae. Like a normal treatment might go for a repeat in the future, might go in for a surgical in the future, even extraction or an implant. But having said this case that you said, which had a huge palatal lesion with a bone loss or a cortical plate defect, these generally may not heal the way we want because the plate is missing. First of all, I would ask for a scan. A CBCD scan is always and always indicated, not for missed canals or cracks or fractures. Just to... If I can see what I cannot see, it's okay. But if I cannot see the buccolingual picture and I'm doubting something more, that's when I want the third dimension. And right. if I see a palatal defect, or then I need to be more cautious about it. We will definitely go with a non-surgical approach. It also depends on how large the defect is, but we know the palatal tissue doesn't behave as well. So often said than not, I think eventually it might be taking up a surgical approach. But doing a surgical approach on the palatal side is just not easy. You have to take a buckle approach. So that much of damage, that much of destruction. So I think you need to start planning everything in total, you know? Yeah, Thank great. You. Thank you, sir. So if number of instruments is influential, then where does the single file system come into play? I mean, are they effective? My question, Narsiman, sir, will you take it up? Or yes, Lukas, can I? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, no, no, please, please, Nara. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Since you have to leave, take this question. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the topic is is to understand that uh, the size matters so if uh, with a single file you are able to prepare a root canal in a basic shape of preparation to a size that is similar to the same size that you can obtain with three or four files at the end your disinfection will be will be the same 
Uh, what, what matters then is the apical refinement of the preparation. There, let's, let's make a rule. There is one of the few uh, randomized clinical studies in endodontics demonstrating that we have a proportionally increased success rate in percentage by increasing the uh, apical size of, of preparation by two, three, four, or five times more the first initial binding file. So uh, what, the, the single file can obtain the same disinfection because this is a basic preparation. Uh, then what matters is an apical refinement and uh, the, the, the further disinfection. And from the, our, our own Indian students and Indian colleagues perspective, simple, the more number of files you're gonna put, the more chances of hydrogenic errors. So it's, uh, it's, it's very simple that if you're going to keep it as simple as possible to one file, the number of hydrogenic fires is going to be uh, definitely lesser. And secondly, most important, as all accepted, time is money. You keep your shaping to the base minimum and you spend a lot of time on irrigation so that you finish it as much as quick as possible. Okay. Yes, the other factor is that if you are using a sequence of files, probably you are using more irrigants for more time. So you have to standardize the timing also for the single files. Okay, so uh, my, uh, another question, uh, Vivek, sir, since we touched on lasers, since the laser light goes in a straight line, we all know that. So how is it, uh, how is it going to remove uh, or do debridement of the can uh, canals the lateral or you have a lot of apical deltas? How do lasers work there? A good question. Uh, that's the reason I mentioned about the newer tips like uh, pips. If you see the pip, the last three millimeters, there's a strip and the tip is conical. So it actually forms a bubble and the bubble will implode and explode, which also goes to say, like in the sweeps, there are two bubbles. One bubble is released and the second goes and hits that and that's how the cavitation happens. Oh. So that's the trick behind the whole procedure. Oh. I think there may be a confusion in the question. When you talk of laser, please don't look at the flexible fibers, which are like 200 micron, which was used for uh, earlier procedures of root canal sterilization, of putting it in the root end, making it a circular motion, apical, middle, coronal, three times per canal, five to 10 seconds per canal at 1.5 watts or 2.5 watts. This was what was taught to us with NDAG or uh, uh, diodes. But today we are talking about Erbium Yang. The fiber is a sapphire tip, a glass tip, which is a short one at the entry point. They are firing it there. So you're not looking at the root end firing it all. So it is basically activating the chemical for it to give that photoacoustic streaming. That's how it works, okay, with the newer tips. Thank you. Sir, uh, and another question which has uh, come out that since uh, first initially when sodium hypochlorite was introduced, uh, people said that in enhancing uh, or heating sodium hypochlorite would enhance the efficacy. So now uh, we know that from external to internal when it goes that things changes. Nobody is able to maintain the heat of sodium hypochlorite. So now the concept of internal heating of sodium hypochlorite comes. So how is that internal heating of sodium hypochlorite effective? I want uh, one uh, researcher's view, uh, Vasudev sir or Venkatesh sir, you can pitch in. And I also need a clinician view. H how do you feel it? Uh, feel about it? Uh, yeah you can use hypochlorite because externally heating and using hypochlorite inside the canal is no more you done it is always you agitate the hypochlorite inside the root canal either by laser or by ultrasonics which the studies have shown it has got a very good antimicrobial and tissue dissolving property so no more nobody can uh, heat it externally by a, uh, it warmers or etc and deliver it inside the root canal it is better you irrigate and then agitate while agitating by using a laser system or by using the ultrasonics, automatically heat will be generated. And it is shown to be very effective, research-wise, evidence -based. So from the clinical perspective, it's almost the same. It's just the same. Only thing is, in case if you are using any polymer-based materials, so in that case, you have to impart heat into the pulp chamber. So for that, you can use any, any gadget like a touch and heat or a calamus or an elements. You just keep it over there for a few minutes so that you raise the temperature and you just activate it You're using your polymer base. And as he said, if you're using an ultrasonic or a laser, a separate heating device is not required. Okay. In fact, uh, this is a good question. Uh, from taking it from outside the heated hypochlorite into the canal, 
there is loss of energy you are going to lose the heat itself so now the concept is put hypochlorite inside and take a 30/04 tip of a down pack instrument i think many people have spoken about it uh, gianluca would know alfredo yandalo i think he has also published a paper on that basically they take it to a temperature of 150 or 180 degrees in a down pack instrument and try and activate for 20 seconds or 30 seconds 30 seconds the circular motion you're never static not stationary you're motionary try and go up 30 oh for only because you can go far deep down and then you withdraw it in a circular motion now that's only to enhance the efficacy of sodium hypochlorite for more chlorine release yes. thank you uh so my another question uh, is to venkate sir so as ma'am uh, and you also clearly stated that uh, we have to take five years evidence back the line and see the quality of papers and not quote papers which are around 10 to 20 years uh, back which are not gold standard papers but uh, we also feel that systematic reviews which are published before and i also have done a personal study the quality of evidence in systematic review is not that great just because it's a systematic review we cannot say that it is a good systematic review what do you feel that if we have to take a systematic review for an endodontic uh, uh, purpose or as a key article what uh, a primary elements we should look into it and which systematic review according to you would be a gold standard to take it as a so called key article okay it's a good question coming to systematic review you have to trust only the last 3 to 5 years of systematic review okay the first reason is as you know if you take the last 3 years most of the article would have been updated this is the first point so i recommend 3 to 5 years next is the quality of the included studies plays a key role if you see most of the systematic review they used to do the risk of bias assessment yeah. so in the conclusion they used to say whatever might be the conclusion however the quality of the included studies is very less so it has to be considered with little caution so it means you have to be a little bit careful in taking those conclusions so based on this recent years plus the quality of included studies in that particular systematic reviews you have to take a call how accurate the systematic review is okay thank you all there is a huge uh, attendance of questions and i have taken few key ones which i felt is more clinically relevant and from research point of view it's also there but i'll i'll take one last question by dr karnakaran sir who has uh, who has just asked that uh, please throw a light on management of open apexes with lasers and limitation and i would like to add that if there is an open apex then how do we do irrigation because we don't have an apical stop yes uh, that's a good question sir uh, the thing is with when it comes to lasers like i said sir the photon induced photoacoustic streaming tips the pips or the sweeps they kept at the entry point of the canal at the coronal third the solution that you'll be using is maybe hypochlorite but only a diluted version you won't even go maybe till 3% all what you're trying to do is trying to get that tubular flow yes any technique even with a good epical matrix there is a good chance you like it or not some amount will still go beyond that's the same thing even with the uh, lasers but there are enough and more studies proving the point like roland de moor has worked a lot from ghent university has worked a lot on this professor moritz from uh, university of vienna he has worked on it so there are a couple of studies which can support and say that yes they would also say we use the most diluted version the liquid dta just to cleanse the system to the end but yes it's a very good question in open apex please be cautious not only about lasers but also of the chemicals used or also the technique that you are using if something that goes beyond is going to be harmful for us and for the patient thank you thank you so much since questions are pouring in uh, i have posted it in the individual uh, whatsapp group to all the uh, panelists and uh, if uh, somebody can take those questions they can answer there and i will make sure the audience get the answers through whatsapp or the other social media channels we have so from my side uh, i'm done paromita ma'am you can have the last word and i will play the promo video for the next panel discussion thank you lora and thank you audience for your questions
and we are sorry that we could not take up all because there are lots of questions and i'm also sorry i apologize that uh, we are really running out of time we cannot play the videos so uh, i'm uh, sorry for that but then laura you can take over let our audience participants know what is upcoming and thank you everyone for your great presence and lot of time you've given us as dr platino said that he has taken time off from his practice and the man behind the show we cannot forget him dr b mohan over to you laura Thank you, one and all, for being part of this uh, extensive panel discussion. Uh, though we had, uh, we exceeded the time, but uh, I, I feel that no time limit is possible for this topic. We try to encompass a lot of things in such a limited period of time. My personal thanks to Vibha Ma'am, Paromita Madam, an excellent moderator, and uh, Mohan Sir, who was the man behind uh, behind the scenes, did not come on the screen, but we know that he's going to be there next week. So we are going to uh, derive a lot of uh, uh, educational uh, skills from Mohan Sir through the webinar because he's he'll be the one of the panelists for the next one. So thank you, viewers, for watching our uh, panel discussion, and thanks to each of the each panelist. Namaste from India. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Thank you much. Thank you all. Sayonara. See you soon. Bye.